African. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the redeemer and the champion of liberty, of human equality. Let's salute him, fellow Ghanaians, the nation's founder, Saji Kwame Krumah. May God bless him, Ghana Shobal, Africa's great son, Saji Dr. Krumah. Good morning to you wherever you are. Thanks for joining the Mother World Talk Shows, Alaji and Alaji. It's another Saturday morning, the 25th of July, 2020. Next week, by this time, would have been in August. Getting closer to the 2020 elections. We will be getting closer to December 7th. The registration is still ongoing. But very importantly, we are now past 30,000 when it comes to the number of cases that have been officially recorded. Uh, by Ghana uh, in terms of COVID-19. That does not in any way mean that everyone who has been infected has been captured in those numbers. Not even the best, uh, the most advanced of country have been, has been able to do that. So please take good care of yourself. The protocols are very important. No mask should always be worn. Wash your hands regularly. Use sanitizers. Those are very important things that you need to do. My name is Senna Nombo. It's always my pleasure to welcome you to the Ramada World Talk Shows, Alaji and Alaji. Here we say it as it is, no matter who is involved, in the end we'll leave you better educated. We are live on Pan-African Television, a broadcast line from the studios in Abilinkwe. We are also live on Ahunto 92.3 FM. They are major radio partners. If you go to social media, we are on Pan-African <coughs> Television on Facebook. Pan-African Television, spelled out in full. We are also on Radio Gold 905 FM. And of course, we are on Adam Fopan Media in Paris. A big thank you to the guys at Adam Fopan Media in France. And also, across the country, we are on various radio stations. Diamond, Diamond FM in Tamale is to us live, Global FM in Ho, and also Shine FM. Thank you for making time. Now, let me start this morning by reading to you a statement that was issued by the National Democratic Congress yesterday and applied to the decision of the court, the Supreme Court, in the matter of whether or not the existing voters' ID cards or birth certificates should be included in the documents that were supposed to have been used for the ongoing registration exercise. And this is uh, the statement. It's titled, the NBC applies for review of Supreme Court judgment on exclusion of birth certificates and existing voter ID cards from voter registration requirements. And it says that this afternoon, the National Democratic Congress calls to be filed an application for the review of the judgment of the Supreme Court in the case involving the current voter registration exercise, which judgment was delivered on 25th June 2020. As a political party, when the judgment was delivered, we did not hide our disappointment, but we were powerless to do anything about it at the time because the reasons for the judgment were not, were not given until 15th July 2020. 20 days after the judgment was announced. After that, our lawyers went to work, and true to our expectation, they have come back with a number of very cogent reasons why they think the judgment of the Supreme Court was wrong. We have therefore placed our concerns before the Supreme Court for it to take a second look at its own judgment, and if possible, change its position on, the, on matters that we think are fundamental to citizenship and the right to vote in this country. Our lawyers have raised many serious issues with the judgment of the Supreme Court. We respectfully hold the view that the Supreme Court in several <coughs> cases arrived at these conclusions without due and proper regard for existing laws, and in many cases without the requisite supporting evidence. Two issues, however, stand out among our complaints. One, we take a critical view of the holding of the Supreme Court that our birth certificates are worthless as proof of our identity and thereby our nationality. As our lawyers have stated in the arguments in the review application, quote, registering birth and death has been a basic element in official national record keeping for decades. The certificates resulting from these registers are well known, and with respect to the birth certificate in particular, its relevance for public purposes such as obtaining a passport is very well established. Indeed, it is not only in Ghana that this is the case. Throughout the world, 
and keeping of the of official records of birth and the use of the resulting birth certificate for public purposes is well established. End quote. A Ghanaian birth certificate shows one's date and place of birth, age, parentage, and nationality. Precisely the kind of information that will be required for any form of voter registration. Our lawyers have pointed out that because the connecting factors relevant to determination of national nationality are primarily place of birth and parentage, birth certificates are definitely evidence of great importance for citizenship determination. That's a quote. And it says, this is particularly so, as the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana has enacted a law, National Identity Register, Amendment Act 2017, Act 950, which affirms the efficacy of a birth certificate as an identification document that proves citizenship. We therefore, therefore find it surprising and worrying that the Supreme Court will hold that, quote, a birth certificate is not a form of identification. The second reason, they say, is the Supreme Court's decision that holders of existing voter ID cards cannot use SIM as source of identification. It is also a matter of great concern to us as a political party. It is our view that the holders of existing voter ID cards have acquired rights based on the fact that the Electoral Commission has gone through a process of identifying them ascertaining their ages and nationality, and has adjudged them to be eligible to vote. These data appears on the face of each voter ID card, and in our view, should constitute prima facie identification of each holder for the purpose of any fresh voters registration exercise. What surprises us is that it is the same Electoral Commission which issued this card at high expense to the state that is now alleging strenuously, with hardly any proof, that this own process of issuing those cards was so poisoned that those cards should not be accepted as proof of identity. This we maintain is arbitrary, arbitrary, whimsical, and capricious. So that's a statement that has been issued by the National Democratic Congress. They are going back to court and they are seeking a review of that uh, decision by the Supreme Court. Well, we will be following that. Well, this morning, of course, we are talking about the issues regarding the voter registration. We are back because of the, what the Minister of Special Development Initiatives called a warning shot. She claimed to have fired a warning shot. Several calls have been made for her removal, but she still remains at post. The NPP chairman, on behalf of the party, has thrown their weight behind her. We've also seen uh, a, a tweet, sort of, from the president's cousin, who is said to hold so much power within the government, Gabi Ochedako, saying he's with her. So what to happen to the minister who fired a warning shot and ordered the burning of motorcycles belonging to some agents of the National Democratic Congress and some registrants? Well, we'll be trying to find an answer to that question. And then we'll spend some time on the budget that was read. Uh, yes, Thursday, actually. It was read on Thursday. We'll find some time and talk about it. And then we'll end with a, a poll that was conducted. Uh, the poll was asking one simple question, whether or not the former president, Mahama, deserves a comeback. And well, they say 49% of the people that responded to that poll said yes. But the others were not so sure. Interestingly, it was the youth who were not so sure whether they, he deserves a second chance. Well, I'll be reading to you the story as captured by Ghana Web, and then we'll move on to the discussion. Joining me this morning for this discussion, Comrade Ibrahim Mutala Mohammed, who is a parliamentary candidate of the National Democratic Congress in Tamale Central. Also joining us, the, a member of the MPP's communication team, Mujib Rahman, and then Mr. Elvis Afri Ankara, who is the Director of Elections of the National Democratic Congress. We'll also be joined by Amar Pratt, whose <coughs> voice and face you are familiar with when it comes to this network. She is a gender activist for the discussion today. Thank you for making time to watch and listen to us. We are back with a discussion after this short break. Hello, 
What are you doing? Tuesday to Friday, 7.30 to 9 o'clock p.m. every day. You should be watching The Couch. I'll tell you why. On Tuesdays, we talk social issues, lifestyle, health, all those everyday issues that affect us in the big ways. Let's Wednesdays are for book reviews. Thursdays are for the hard talk, those social, economic, policy-oriented, political questions that demand for the tough questions to be asked. And personality profiling Fridays, when we get to know the stories behind the winning personalities we love. Inspirational story from inspirational personalities. Hey, listen, you really cannot miss the couch with me, Amma, but still, the only TV show with a hat. Market Stories is all about our market. Issues such as sanitation, market structures, storage facility, pricing, bargaining, and everything else that goes on in the market. It's going to be very educative, entertaining, and interactive. We would visit our various markets to with both sellers and buyers to know everything concerning our market. Join me. My name is Maud Ya Ananinati. I'm your market lady. Morning is an important time of the day because how you spend your morning can often tell you what kind of day you're going to have. I want you to have a great day. So start your day with me because I can guarantee a great show every weekday on Good Morning Africa right here on Pan-African Television. I will be serving some inspiration, news, business, health, newspaper review, music, and so much more. Join me, Kwame. Kwame Owusu Danso on Good Morning Africa on Pan-African Television. Let's have a truly African morning. Medasi. Hello. What are you doing Tuesday to Friday, 7.30 to 9 o'clock p.m. every day? You should be watching The Couch. I'll tell you why. On Tuesdays, we talk social issues, lifestyle, health, all those everyday issues that affect us in the big ways. Let's Wednesdays are for book reviews. Thursdays are for the hard talk, those social, economic, policy-oriented, political questions that demand for the tough questions to be asked. And personality profiling Fridays, when we get to know the stories behind the winning personalities we love. Inspirational story from inspirational He has labored, he has suffered, to lead his people into the land of freedom he is the redeemer well, welcome back from that break if you just join us the mother of all talk shows alagi and alagi live on pan-african television my name is senna Nombo, and a big thank you to the crew that is putting me on here at pan-african television uh, the production team led by tijani and also a big thank you to the various media houses for the wonderful work they are doing but if you prefer to listen to us through internet radio you can get a hunt on 92.3 fm on the tuning number or any of the radio streaming apps so you can get radio gold 90.5 fm on the any of those apps and get to listen to us online well let's start the discussion with the shooting incident in kaswa and the implications on the voter registration exercise and the fact uh, that uh, and the fact that uh, the, the, the kind of things you are hearing that the, the, the cid invited her to the police headquarters yesterday and so let's start with that one and uh, I start with the man to my left, Comrade Ibrahim Mutala Mohammed. Comrade. Well, uh, if you permit me, 
I would want to begin by, okay, first and foremost, let me say good morning to, mm. to you and my colleagues and, of course, the good people of Tamale Central. I haven't been on this program you know for some time now and use the opportunity also to urge my constituency executive led by the constituency chairman and the entire election team, particularly our election director and his deputy, they are doing a human's job. I just want to use the opportunity to tell them that I have taken particular notice of their selfless, dedicated service to the party. Working for the party in Tamale Central is not just for working for Mutala, but working for the NDC. And I believe that if other consensus were to follow the examples of the team we have in Tamale Central, I think that inshallah we should be smiling to victory. And I am very confident that other consensus are doing the same. And that is what gives me the confidence that by our last will, we will win the 2020 elections with a huge margin. I think that the, I wanted to say that permit me to begin my comments on this with a quotation by Cesaro. And if you permit me, Cesaro said that politics is the most noble of all callings and that there is no nobler motive for entering polit for politics than the resolution not to be ruled by wicked men. That no individual or combination of individuals should be allowed to become too powerful. I precede my comments with these quotations of Cesaro and many young people who do not know who Cesaro was. Cesaro was like a senator or a member of parliament in the Roman Empire, who was an orator who came from a very poor background, but rose through the ranks. And he was unfortunately finally killed by Augustus Caesar, even though there isn't any concrete evidence that he sanctioned that. But many writers have concluded that Augustus Caesar and many other people must have minded his killing. And he is an orator and he's a, he has written extensively on politics. And it is not for nothing that I proceed with this quotation, because for me, what we are experiencing today in Ghana, even though we have all agreed to charter the path of democracy, but the actions and inactions of those who have the opportunity to lead this country at the moment are not respecting the basic tenets of democratic governance. What we saw at Kaswa is a classical example of a gun welding gangsters masquerading as ministers of state and a leader who has a penchant for violence. Look, there is a saying in the Bani that the guinea fowl cannot be flying and its offsprings will be walking. Once a guinea fowl is seen flying and not walking, certainly its offspring will also be flying. And if, if I can borrow some of the proofs made by Alaji Abiy Fiseni, the MP for Sanargo, that if a chief comes home with a weird haircut, mm. what do you think his subjects will do? They will come home with tapiaju and all kinds of haircuts. What this woman did and what has been done by many MPP activists and ministers in unleashing violence on the people of this country, they are taking cue from the leader of the Republic of Ghana, in this case, President Nanado. He is by nature a very violent person. There is no denying that fact. And it is not just about his commentary, but also about his actions. We are all aware of the all die, be die mantra. We haven't forgotten because when you have a leader who boasts and vaunt about maiming and hurting people at a function and he didn't have the decency to avoid such commentary, taking into consideration the sensibilities of those who were affected and boasted about it, what do you expect his subjects to do? When you have a leader who said that 
if NDC wins the elections in 2000, and I remember that was my first year in the University of Ghana, that there will be bloodshed in Ghana. Many people have forgotten that he made that statement. And I remember a radio station, I'm not too sure whether it was Joy or Radio Gold, interviewed him, and the current discredited, you know, uh, uh, a special prosecutor. And they were online, and I remember that day, the special prosecutor said that in serious democracies, he would have been a shadow vice president. I don't know whether some of you still remember that. And I remember then I was in N block, and I was in my room monitoring the discussion. He made that statement prior to the 2000 elections. Many have forgotten it because we tend to be focusing on the all die be done. We have forgotten that he made that dangerous statement in the 2000 elections and threatened virtually everybody. The same leader, we are told, by people who are closer to him and people who know him better than we do, one of them is Mr. Kumsen of Chronicle, who said famously that he wouldn't be able to sleep should Nanado become the president of the Republic of Ghana. And that even if he attempts to sleep or feigns his sleep, he would ensure that one eye is widely open. For me, that statement was voluminous. That statement speaks to many issues. Unfortunately, our pundits didn't bother to indeed dig deep to find out the reasons. But some of us know the reasons why he made the statement he made. Again, you have another founder of the NPP in the person of Dr. Nyaho Tamaklu, who said that he wasn't going to vote for Nanado because Nanado is not peaceful, and that he would vote for someone who would ensure the safety and the security of this country. Man, you say, now, these are not statements made by NDC people. These are statements made by founding members of the MPP who are still with the MPP, support the MPP, and they have made this statement. And by the way, they are not just founding members of the MPP. They are individuals who have actually worked with the candidate or not President Nanado. They worked with him in private life. They worked with him in politics. So if it is about getting closer to somebody and appreciating the, the behavior and the conduct of that person at any point in time, this is one uh, people that w we have no reason to doubt whatever they say. Again, you have President Kofo in the 2008 elections, who was obviously supporting Mr. Alan Chilmantin. He happened to have held a meeting in Kumasi with MPP regional executive, and he said, that they should vote for someone who is very peaceful. They shouldn't vote for someone who we could not trust the safety and the stability of this country in his hands. This was what President Kufo said. And he ended up urging them. And you know what he did? Craftily, there were two candidates who were the dominant candidates in the elections. Mm. One candidate by God's creation was shorter. Another candidate by God's creation was taller. And President Kufo didn't want to just say that the violent person I'm referring to is President or Mr. Nanado. But he said, don't vote for the short man. The one when you get to a crowd, you would have to climb things to be able to, to see him. Vote for the person when you stand in the crowd, you can easily. So it, it, the, it wasn't in doubt that he was making a That was what he said. <laughs> oh, he said that. I would give, I would give you the video. Look, and you know what? After this, when I finish and when we go on break, I'll show you the video. I have the video. He said, "Don't vote for the." I'm surprised you are the only person who le was leaving if I can borrow complete the Cyprus statement in Kosumakaya. Because that statement was made. It was a public statement. And you are the only one for the it, first time. No, it I got leaked. I have just told you. I have can I? Can I? This. I've just told you I have the video in my phone when I finish. No, said, and when I show the video to you, to tell me. the viewing public that you've actually seen the video. That's what he said. He said that don't vote for the one who. who when you get to a crowd and he's in a car, you have to climb things to be able to see him. This were his statements. So everybody knew that in reference to a violent person, President Kufo was talking about Mr. Nana do at the time. I mean, put aside all these statements that people made. One may say that perhaps uh, Abraham Kumsen, uh, Kumsen, right? 
the chronicle uh, yeah. uh, editor. Yeah. Kofi Kumsin, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I was making a say Abraham Kumsin with the textile and garment. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's assume that Kofi Kumsin, uh, Dr. Nyahu Tomoklu, uh, President Nanado, had a beef to settle with Nanado. Let's assume. Let's assume that they simply didn't like Nanado, and it's understandable. Within the same party, you may have people who may not like him. And we, let's also assume that those statements were occasioned by the fact that they had their preferred candidates for which reason they could do anything to discredit Mr. Nanado, now President Nanado. Now let us look at his conduct when he got the power to see whether those people were justified in making the kind of statements they made about him. And Mujib, agree with me, in this country, President Nanado appointed his own Ashanti Regional Security Commander. This man was beaten to pulp by a terror group that was formed by President Nanado, financed by then candidate Nanado. There is no denying the fact that Mr. Nanado, then the candidate of the MPP in 2000, you know, and eight, uh, 2012 elections, mm -hmm. never condemned the activities of the invisible forces. As a matter of fact, he endorsed their activities. His spokespersons and the general secretary of the NPP made those infamous statements, defending and justifying the activities of the invisible forces. And once again, it comes to feed into the proverb I gave, that if the chief comes home with a weird haircut, what do you expect his subjects to do? Now, assuming without admitting, the president, Nana, then candidate Nanado, was not in support of invisible forces. At least, one noble thing he could do was to condemn those actions and infractions, the hurting they had, not even against people within the NDC, but even people within the MPP. He never condemned their actions. So if you assume that they did that, but look at what happened to his security coordinator. The gentleman was beaten to pulp. Now, this gentleman who beat the man to pulp, as a result of pressure exerted on the government and the people of this country, they feigned a prosecution. I say fair in the prosecution because when prosecution is fraudulently done, the outcome is going to be fraud. Now, the power and the responsibility to prosecute is the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. They took them to court. At the end of the day, what did they say? Nolle prosequa. At least the LLB I did. Nolle prosequa doesn't mean acquittal. Nolle prosequa simply means, in simple terms, that you are not able to get enough evidence to proceed with the prosecution. So what you do is that you enter nolle prosecutor. So more or less, in a layman's language, a suspension of the case until you are able to gather enough evidence. But you know oh, why? Okay. They deliberately put in measures to ensure that they will not have any evidence. The very day the people went into the court, they went and freed that man, but for the intervention of the police, they would have lynched the judge. That day, their spokesperson spoke granted interviews with alacrity, justifying what they did in court. You know what? They never arrested that gentleman who spoke to radio stations in Kumasi. The very people who were captured on the TV, they never tried, sent any of them to court. They went and picked people with whom they knew that there couldn't be any substantial evidence supporting the case of the prosecution in this case, the Minister for Justice and Attorney General. So if they send people who, who were not found or captured in the TV, they didn't send the person who granted in interview claiming to be the leader of those terror groups who unleash the violence. And this is something that has never happened in any democratic dispensation, where a court of competent jurisdiction trying individuals for committing a crime, and you had a terror group that went into that court and freed those individuals and spoke. They never prosecuted the guy who spoke on radio stations, justifying. I mean, it starts to reason rationally that the first person you should even prosecute is the person who granted interview, justifying the actions they did. They never did that. So it is not surprising that they came with knowledge prosecutor. The simple question is, assuming without admitting that they didn't even remember that someone spoke on radio justifying the action, and therefore, they were justified in entering the Nolly Prosecutor. Why is it that they are still not telling us anything if Nanado still believes 
that he is a democrat, the doyen of Ghanaian dem dem democracy, and that someone who fought for the rights of people at any point in time. Yet an opportunity presented itself before him that your own regional security coordinator was beaten to pulp, his human rights were absolutely violated. You are disinterested in that. Another very important point that I will raise to justify why I say that he has a penchant for violence. The same person, Nanka Bruce, was beaten to pulp at the seat of government. You know why? The government was not interested in finding out those who beat Nanka Bruce. The investigation was commenced to establish who took the videos. Who took the videos? But for the videos, we wouldn't have known that anything of such happened at the seat of government. So clearly, there is ample evidence to conclude, without any doubt, that yes, you have gangsters, gun wielding gangsters masquerading <coughs> as ministers of state, sadly and unfortunately appointed by a leader who has a penchant for violence. But what hurts me as a young person in politics is the loud silence. The so-called the, the National Peace Council, the so-called some of the civil society organizations, the so-called peace setters and defenders of our democratic governance, they are in a complete state of incommunicado. And for me, that is the shocking aspects of it. If anything of this had happened under the NDC, I am telling you that would have been the basis for the justification for the removal of the NDC. But what we see today, any time the MPP zigs, a section of the Ghanaian media, and largely the moral society, they zags. And therefore, they see nothing wrong with what happens in this country. And when NDC get angry, and the NDC realize that it is becoming too much, that our people have been beaten to pulp for doing nothing except that exercising their democratic right. And then you have our communication director who says, that if anybody attacks you, defend yourself. You have suddenly seen those people. They have suddenly found their voices. Perhaps they are borrowed voices. And they are commenting on this. To climax that, we had Ayahuasca West Wagon, you know, incident. It was not an incident against the NDC. It was an incident against the very tenant of our democratic growth as a state. We were having a registration exercise, right? Uh, an election. election yeah. An election to elect a candidate to represent the people of Ayahuasca West Wagon. You had 10 groups of the MPP masquerading as national security operatives, headed by a minister in charge of national security. They went there and unleashed violence on people. People are being maimed. I am aware of a gentleman who is still on bed as a result of the terror that was unleashed. This gentleman is a married man with kids. Their kids no longer enjoy the tender and the affection that they otherwise would have had from their dad. The father can no longer hug the kids because when I get home, the thing that, 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 that I, I see first is that my kids run to me and I hug them. This man and the kids no longer get that affection. President Nanado, if he's listening and watching, that man and those kids, you have destroyed their future. You have destroyed the fatherly affection they otherwise would have got from their father. You have destroyed that because of the terror groups that you train, finance, and supervise, the terror that they unleashed. So when you begin to talk about some of these things, you talk about them not just on the basis of political differences, but what is morally right or morally wrong is morally wrong regardless the justification. In an attempt to find a justification for a moral wrong action, then you are telling people how evil and devilish you are. There can't be any justification for any moral wrong action that is perpetrated deliberately by any group of individuals in the name of political power against any individual. So when you find ministers making the statement, it's shocking. But you know what, Senna? The very day the incident happened, the minister granted interviews. She never mentioned in any of the interviews that her car was vandalized. She never mentioned in any of her interviews that people attacked her car. The next day, the narrative started changing. 
I listened to the MPP national, in fact, I watched the MPP national chairman. By the way, I who I'm wondering whether he's still a CPP man or an MPP man, because the last time mm. I checked, he was. Well, he's the an chairman MP of the MPP. So. Well, the MPP, even Mujib here, if he's going to be sincere, he will tell you that they don't trust him because he is only a chairman by virtue of Nanado wanting him to be there. Because within the MPP, it's not just a leader, it's a king who is ruling them. And who dare you to question the decision of the king? And then what he said was that, oh, it was in self-defense. Oh, oh, it was in self-defense that he was defending herself. And look at the excuse she gave. That she was given an information. That people were being bused to the registration center. Seriously. Every political party has a representation at every single registration center. I am I'm a participant in this exercise. I have a polling agent. I had information several times about certain things that were done by my opponent. I didn't get up there with terror groups and then took my gun, load the gun with bullets, put them in my pocket and go there. What I did was that I got in touch with the elections, uh, the EC officials. At least every, every electoral area, they have a one in charge of operations. Now, in some instances, I got direct to the EC district uh, metropolitan director. And in fact, there were some instances I called the regional EC director to raise those concerns. You have a minister of state who is paid with our taxes, a minister of state who, by virtue of her position, is entitled to a security provided by the state, paid by myself and you. That minister of state claimed that the security man wasn't there, and therefore she needed to go with those people. Couldn't she have called any of the police station to provide her with a security? And in any case, if you heard that something like that was going on, then what is the use of your letter officers present? Your letter officers should be the people you should complain to so that they can complain to the, dis uh, the, the district electoral officer or the one in charge of operations. You went there, guns were shot, and the narrative given contradicts the narrative given by the police. The police claimed that they chased an urban vehicle and arrested about four people and found a gun. Now, it stands to reason that this government is not going to prosecute this woman because she is admitting that she shot the gun. As a result of shooting the gun, people ran for their own safety and got hurt. The hurting of those people was occasioned by the shooting of the gun. Now, let's assume that no only other person shot the gun except the minister, because she's the only person who was so truthful and honest enough to admit that she shot the gun. The terror group didn't shoot the gun. I shot the gun as a result of shooting the gun. People are still in hospital. Now, whose responsibility is it? that those people are suffering. I, at least, I did the law of thoughts. And it tells me that she should be held absolutely responsible for the, for the infractions, for the hurting of the people who are now struggling. So you see, I just want to speak directly to the people of this country and conclude that with all these frustrations and anger, with all these insensibilities to the plight of the Ghanaian people, with all this hurt, this insensitiveness, Forget of the TV that goes on in this country. Forget of the family and friends and girlfriends appointment that goes on in this country. But the safety of your people, the safety of the people of this country, there is a solution. And that solution is that please go register on the 7th of December. Let's show them the exit. I tell you, President Kufour wouldn't have done what this gentleman did. President Kufour wouldn't have dared do what Nana Akufuado is doing. And I speak to the MPP people who saw what happened under President Kufour. The, the decency, you may challenge it, at least that exhibited within the MPP, that they were not even discriminating against certain class of people. You have an opportunity to vote out this government. So these elections is not about NDC, NPP. It's about the safety of this country. It's about sanitizing our democratic governance. It's about ensuring that the cake that is provided for all of us, that every young person, regardless where you are coming from, you have an equal opportunity with any other person in this country. Unfortunately, we are not getting that under this government. And politics is not a religion.
politics is not incumbent on anybody. It's about choices. You have the opportunity to make decent choices by voting out this disaster we have as a government. Comrade, thank you very much. Uh, if you're joining us, the matter of all talk shows, I like you and I like you. A couple of your messages, then I'll move to Mujib Rahman. Uh, Sapi Agboy saying the Supreme Court should still insist that our birth certificates are worthless. And all documents that are procured with the birth certificate should be withdrawn <coughs> and declared invalid. Furthermore, the judges should be made to define citizenship as enshrined in the 1992 Constitution and to explain how same will be determined. In addition, the judges should disclose how they can prove their Ghanaian citizenship. With the due says having a passport is not a necessity, but the birth certificate is. Rukai Abubakar says, you know, it's in order to go back to court, even in America, birth certificate holders are considered first citizens followed by natural citizens who acquire their citizens based on naturalizations. So it is wrong to relegate birth certificate to the background and making ethnicity, passport, and Ghana card a priority. So one of the dog says, says, uh, if just a voters register, how Rambo comes in firing gun, what happens come December 7, 2020? Is she going to be using granites or bombs? The Minister of State who conducted herself in such a manner is still at post, and a scheme of an arrest was cried yesterday. But a citizen was arrested in just less than two hours and prosecuted. What are we doing to ourselves? But let them know if they can justify it with self-defense, we are as well prepared to use our seats to protect ourselves on that day, or we'll make them... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief Odogo. Mujib. But you <laughs> should also be putting us online when we are going overboard. But you don't allow us and who is, who is we that? should be saying all what <laughs> manner of things that doesn't yeah. even relate to the top. He has gone overboard. Ah, but you don't know. <laughs> but let me let me let me start by saying that. Yes, yes. <laughs> he has the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has the phone. Okay. Good. <laughs> no, but all of all, you want to come in. All you want to come in. No, but if you want, you can come in. Then I summarize all of them, and then and then, okay. and then, no, no, and then we get up and go. We just go. So now, first of all, it is not true, and I found it very. Uh, it's not fair and proper to describe the president of the Republic of Ghana as somebody who have penchant for violence. But I will say that uh, Sina, that brought us to the point of pick and choose. That we all know the president and how he started before becoming president and his records. Today, Sina, all of us sitting here believe that whatever we see here, we can go home and sleep and have peace of mind without any fear of intimidation or harassment or whatever. It is not for nothing. Some people in this country, I believe my brother has done history, has fought for what we are experiencing today. And Sina, you can't write the history of this country at a point without referring to the man who is tearing the affairs of the Republic of Ghana today in the person of Nana Dudanko Akufuado. People, we, are not, we don't have short memory. Even though at a point in our lifetime we are referring to people who have short memory. But let me indicate, Sina, there was a time in this country that to even speak the truth, to even come out and vent your frustrations and anger in this country in itself was a crime. But today, the opportunity are given to all Ghanaians. You can write, you can forget the opportunity, you can through the radio station, TV station, you can add up your voice to the development of this country. It wasn't for nothing. Therefore, to describe the president of the republic for somebody who has pensioned for violence and try to pick and choose, that one belongs to the individual. But Sina, let me, I want to start by looking at it in a very uh, nationalistic point of view before I come to the uh, point by point. We all have a country to build. Sina, those culture of talent days were all being affected. You see the truth, your right has been trampled upon but you are quiet because you fear if you do see, then you will be in trouble. Some of the very few journalists my brother mentioned know what they went through. Have you forgotten of the shit bombing? That people who write about stories to change and shape the future of this country was being attacked on a daily basis in this country. 
I hope you are getting the point. But that is the, that. Is, but you know who did it. You know who did it. We know. You know who did it. And I see. But these very people today, you sit comfortable and describe as people who, who have violence, were the people on the street to change the face of this country for you and I. So Mutala, today, this morning, I am challenging you. It is the duty of us to also perfect the system for our children that we refer to to come and enjoy it. But let me also go back. If we have a state minister who is paid by the taxpayers of myself, Gombrin Mutala, and the other and other Ghanaian and, and all Ghanaians, telling us that violence beget violence in Tallency, is that person fit to be a state minister, a special minister of interior in charge of our security, a national security in charge of changing the face of the security face of this country and saving the life of people? could use national media to tell the people of Ghana that violence begets, begets violence. But those were the elements we have just not quite long ago. And we condemn A, we have to condemn B. I hope you are getting my point. Mm -hmm. My brother, you refer to uh, some elections, people waging war in 2000. If NDC has, MPP has no, uh, don't win <coughs> the elections, Ghana will be. You haven't forgotten of 2008. The strategy of the National Democratic Congress was on the on major markets across the length and breadth of this country. And you could see the posture at that time. And the language was that they must be changed at all costs. If NDC doesn't win the elections, Ghana was going to be a, a, a war zone. Who said that? Who said that? The members of NDC Who? were going around saying it. Who? I hope you, 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 you get my point. When you were talking, my brother, I didn't interject. Oh, you did. Why? So you don't have the patience to listen to more. <laughs> See now, I am saying all this because no, both NDC and MPP can claim perfection when it comes to violence in this country. But Sina, I am not the type, and it's not my style of politics, trying to equalize and say, oh, because this one has done and is bad, I will not help in our democratic dispensation. Let me equal it with what has happened before. Then we, I can be in a safe zone. If that is our future, where are we going as a people? Like my brother seeks to do. He tried to see that NDC is the best. NDC, under NDC, nothing untoward has happened in terms of violence perpetrated on the people of this country. Meanwhile, that is not true. Violence is violence and it's bad. So if you condemn it, if it happens in MPP time, Please be genuine and sincere to condemn it, what happened during your time. In that case, we are building a better society for ourselves and for our future generations. And I think that that is the part we had to, we had to be doing as a people. But if you want to close your eyes on what you have done, and now you want to protect what is happening now, that is not fair. Sina, to come to the main point, I personally think that uh, what happened was not the best and should be condemned by all but unfortunately those we can't jump into condemnation because we have we are in a law governing society and if something happened and that is not right but the right people to take it up is the security agencies hmm. and investigate as to whether or not the gun was fired by the minister or not the minister as other people are alleging it is the duty of the security force of that, for that matter, the police, to investigate the matter and feed the public the truth by their report. And exactly... The minister said she did it. Not uh, precisely, people. of course. And other quarters are also saying that it is not the minister. Yeah. And if we listen to the press conference by the Electoral Commission, they vehemently disagree with the minister. And in that score, what do we do? And the, I, the minister was invited by the mm -hmm. Central Regional Police Command. And I think that the investigations has commenced. So let's wait. And I the, think it's with the CID. The CID, yeah, the CID under the, the yeah, and wait for the, the the outcome, the report, if it, the investigation to conclude, and we get the report, and then we take it up there. And nobody is saying that if you are a state minister, you are MP, even though there are laws to some extent can put it. But when you flout the, the same laws. The laws will take you on. And that is my personal position. But those people like my brother and others who are trying very hard to score political points, 
would not inure to the benefit of all of us. That is why there's another group of people are also justifying and defending the position of the minister. Because in their criticism, when you analyze it, you don't see good faith in it. We were in this country when the same electoral processes, people went around to observe what was happening. But you know what happened to Esla in Abuja, Nepal, at the Odedi constituency? You know, not quite long ago. Yeah. We're slapping yeah. and beating people yeah. and intimidating yeah. people. Yeah. And, but these are people, you just yeah. said yeah. it here. You, you, you go around to observe what is going on in your constituency. Other people also have the same equal right to go around and also observe what is happening. But you don't necessarily, because you are in power and you have all the uh, security, the, 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 the power in your hand to, to, to unleash a uh, mayhem and, 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 and try to intimidate the people. That is not fair. But you can't deny the fact that these people have mentioned one time in our political life, we also have also experienced this. And this, that is not fair. So, but you can also, but let's be sincere, mm. even self-defense. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a defense in, in cases in law, in murder case, extreme when at a point you know your life is in danger. You can defend yourself, but it is the duty of you and your legal team to convince the court that indeed it was self-defense. But don't try to make mockery of it as if it is not in existence. That is not the point. Mutala, we all go around working, doing our own things. But at a point when you realize that your life is in danger, you have been attacked, and you don't have gun. You even resort to take stools and other available items that you find that you can also use to defend yourself. It is very significant. But I think that let's don't stand into jubilation and jumping and try to paint the picture as if the people of Ga the Ghanaian people life are in threat. We are in lawless state. The security has broken. So we need uh, we, that we haven't reached that point, my brother. We haven't reached that point. Yeah, on the issue of Tigray and all those things, let's all stop. My brother, you don't go around your constituency observing what is happening currently alone. You go with other people that are around in your company. Hello. So that is how everybody does. You do it, Mutala. You don't go alone. You don't, and you sat here one time ago and told us that, and the people of Ghana, when you were a deputy, of, a deputy minister, you don't use a police. Yes. You don't use police. So if today your colleague minister she is not using the police officer, uses. will you be criticizing that? God. I hope you are getting the argument. So that point, I'm let's. I'm not getting it. Oh my God, my God! I think <laughs> you allow me, Mutala, please to 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 put my 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 thoughts together. So, but let's go a little bit history. Where did we come by this tiger and all those? My memory is still fresh. In it. When you look at the 1996 coming elections, those time, it was Jamal Rollins. My brother, let's be very sincere to ourselves. If so now you have a witness in my constituency electoral area, what those days we call commandos, police and soldier military officers, the dress alone will scare you. You would dare you to get closer. That is the genesis of what we are experiencing today. That people have to now train people, equip them to guide them individually, or it's a political party security force. The Delta Force, the Invisible Force, the Hawks, what is it, Motala? It will help. If today you use it and now no also use it, we have a perfect system. Have you disbanded your Hawks in Kumasi? You can look into the face of Ghanaians and say that no, we moving into the 2020 elections. NDC as a political party will not use a, this individual. All the political parties have they have signed a communique, pledging to disband all the this this uh, uh, groups that are emerging, and the people of Ghana will take us on, because the, the 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 safety and the future of this country is important, and all these political parties, when you look at their manifesto, it's about how to get power and transform and change the living of the people of Ghana and better the economy. So when you end up by killing all of us, so who are you going to superintend over? So it is not fair that well, some of these things we try to come and just pick, choose what we want the people to hear, and they hear it. And the wild allegation, me, 
right from 2007, that was the famous uh, 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 MPP primaries. I have not, I have not seen any video alleging that President Kofu, to the extent of even describing using the height of these uh, personalities, to oh, it's not fair. Let's don't. It's not fair. And Mutala, I you have finished. I believe by now you would have sent the video to me. To I have no scene, but so I have it, been it is in the, the height aspect in, that you are challenging. But not, not the other things that he, he said to have said. I've, I've, I've also uh, watched a video, okay. and he was admonishing people how people look, the country, nature, and how what the factors people consider in trying to give people political power. Mm -hmm. And that, but he didn't mention them. He didn't use height. And it is his right to say it. Okay. It is his right to say it. And it's very important. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the party decided. And the person the party decided on eventually is the president of the Republic of Ghana today. So you can therefore say that, oh, at that time, he was against this person. And this was what he was saying. That is not fair. So let's don't try to bring those things. When people might have their preferred and preferences. And that is allowed in democracy. For instance, yesterday, we all know Atamils was the president of the Republic of Ghana some time ago. May he so rest in perfect peace. He's no more. But the party, we saw the party want to commemorate his, his demise. And the party itself is divided. You see the former press secretary of the president and the former president of the Republic, as well as the founder of the party, going ahead to do it, instead of being with the main party structures, I believe that, that that is not fair to the professor. The professor didn't leave a, a divided party. The professor left, that is why we call him as Nduehene, man of peace. The professor left a very united party. But they, they couldn't unite themselves to, to, to pay their, their, their tribute to the, to, the, to, the, to the late professor. And I think, Motala, you people have a lot to do. You have to go back to the drawing board. What is happening now, it is no good. Because you have to position yourself as the alternative for the people of this country. But seeing what is happening now, and I, I'm, I'm not surprised that uh, they are not prepared. And nobody will give power to a group of people that are unprepared. Because the future, the development, and the building of the economy of this country is paramount and dear to the heart of the people of Ghana. And I believe sincerely, what is happening now, it will be difficult. In 2020, it just four more to do more. That is what we are going to experience. I've sent him. I've sent Thank him you. The video. Thank you. What, what you have said, I've seen it, but there's no where the man said what you have said. Oh, 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 so the issue of the height. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> 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 thank you very much. We'll all watch it. Let us see our TV to go to any last of We'll watch it here. Please let me let me read let me read the messages and go to Mr. Mr. Fuyanka. Then you see our quote is joining us on Facebook. Says Sena, our governing political leaders should show me one poor person in Ghana who possesses a separate meter. That will enable him or her consume just around the lifeline of 19 cities a month <laughs> to enjoy the so-called COVID-19 electricity freebies. And I will show them millions of Ghanaians to the contrary. It was politically crafted for psychopolitical effect on the altar of very negligible cost. It won't wash and seem is rubbish forthwith. It is okay to do propaganda with these things because we are in, act we are in an election year. But it is just a matter of time and the reality will manifest and that time is already at hand. Um, okay, I've read. Uh, Uredu just says, did I hear him say people can say whether they like uh, and sleep well with no intimidation? Very much say to two. Okay, two for the convener of Crossfire says, I want to thank all those who attended the meeting as a lecture organized by Crossfire Ghana to honor Professor Mills. Let me assure the MPP that the NDC is going to win the elections in spite of the fact that they are using macho men to intimidate people. Let us observe the COVID-19 uh, protocols. And thank you for those messages. Mr. Fuyanka. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I think if we want to look at this uh, Hawa Yakubu incident, it has to be looked at within a context. Hawa Kumsun, sorry. Hawa Yakubu will never do that. Hawa Kumsun. It has to be looked at within the context of all that is going on. Because if you take it as an isolated incident, you will not see the seriousness of it. Now, since the registration started, and if you recall, we opposed this registration because we felt it wasn't necessary, it was costly, and one of the things we said was that 
there were going to be acts of violence because we had intelligence that the MPP and as they are manifesting, we're going to try to suppress people registering in our strongholds. You recall that Osei Chairman Sabonso had said that if there's a new register, the NDC was not going to win any election in Ghana. So they had an agenda to cause mayhem and cause confusion, intimidate people, and suppress votes in our strongholds. Unfortunately for them, um, within 72 hours of the ruling of the Supreme Court, we managed to mobilize our people and get them to come out strongly in their numbers. And that is why wherever you go, you see that NDC people are really, and even ordinary Ghanaians are out there in their numbers and they want to register to vote out this government because they are tired of them. You will recall what happened before the registration when they sent troops to the Aplau border to go and fight COVID. It was a very ridiculous and absurd, you know, <laughs> uh, position to take. In, 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 <laughs> then they said that um, um, they said that uh, it was to prevent the Togolese from coming in, and then God being so good, Katie Hammond came out and spoke the real reason why um, that was being done. You again recall that Gabi Ochidaku had also said things, and he is a British passport holder, and that um, um, the people from the Volta region are Togolese. So you could clearly see that agenda. So it is within that context. And since it started, many, 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 in fact, we have copious pictures, videos, reports on a daily basis of intimidation, of violence, of brutalities, of maiming, of threats, of tribalism uh, happening on a daily basis. We have the reports. So I'll just give you just a few. The same Kaswa. In fact, uh, the incident that happened a few days ago yeah. is just one of many. Almost on a daily basis, there's been fights, there's been gunshots, there's been beatings, there's been maimings, there's been destruction of properties. In fact, in one video, one of our agents, somebody took a cement block. Uh, can somebody get us a block, a cement block? <laughs> you know what a cement block is? Please, respectfully, would you just allow me? Somebody took a cement block uh, and hit his fellow human being's head with a cement block. I mean, which human being would do this to his fellow man? And he was captured on video. The gentleman went, came back, and I'm sure you have it. He was stitched, and he came back. He said, unless you kill me. It's been going on. There was one incident at, at uh, uh, Akutukope where the guy's head was bashed, blood, blood was oozing out. When we showed the video, one of the journalists said he couldn't believe that there could be so much blood oozing from a human being's head all over his clothes and that perhaps it was fake. Fortunately, the deputy communication officer of the constituency was there and he confirmed, mentioned the guy's name and the polling station. Horrible incidents on a continuous basis. What has been happening is that MPP, MMDCs, MPP ministers, MPP MPs, when they are moving, they move with 10, 14, 15 military personnel, plus some few policemen, and then those guys who, you don't know whether they are military or police, they are wearing these black tops and khaki, you know, those Azugu boys, and they are the ones who are causing the mayhem. The evidence about, they are beating people, they just get to the place and they just start beating people, scattering people. There is copious evidence to that effect. I said, I'll give you a few examples. The steps to Christ where they attacked people, uh, violence, and uh, um, uh, the NDC MP for Ejua Sechidumase in the Ashanti region was attacked and almost killed. In fact, he had to feign death. He's almost a cripple now by MPP tax. Abraham Tete, an NDC agent at Odumakwe Junior High School Registration Center, was beaten, his head was butchered and gunshots were fired by these hoodlums. Prosper Chiope, an NDC agent, Charity Love, Mohamed Jibro, they were also attacked at other registration centers in the same Eutu Senya East. Esutifi South, the MPP, NDC, MP, was attacked with pepper spray. Violence erupted in the Aswasi constituency in Kumasi. Um, Tano South constituency, they were intimidating our members. The former MC for Tano South, Bukari Zakaria Anaba at a press conference recounted 
how he was allegedly beaten by the attacks of the MPP. Lejokuku, there was a fist fight over Basin. Doma West constituency beating whole West in the Volta region. I mean, it is it's, it's incredulous, you know. And when these things are happening, as citizens of Ghana, we cannot just sit back and we try to equalize. We cannot, equalization is not the answer. Because in 1992, we decided that enough of military rule, we're moving into a democracy. Democracy is a process, it grows. So 1992 was a transition. There are stages in democratic development. After the transition, the true test of a democracy that is beginning to stabilize is turnover of power. So we lost in 2000, MPP came to power. So for the eight years, you see that our democracy was beginning to stabilize. And then you see institutions begin to consolidate, media freedoms and all those things. And then another turnover of power in 2008. So again, the consolidation is further deepened. And then it went on institutions deepened. And unfortunately, we had a peaceful person like Professor Mills who was very liberal. So again, we entrenched that culture of freedom, people were able to speak. People said all kinds of unprintable things against Professor Mills. He never reacted in any negative way. So by now, we should have deepened and consolidated our democracy. As we speak now, because of these things happening, we've gone back 10, 15 years. We have retrogressed in our democracy. These things are unacceptable in a democracy. It's totally and totally unacceptable. You know why? Because when you create this, these kinds of conditions, if you are not careful, you are given opportunity for an adventurer to say, look, this whole democracy is not working, it's not worth it, and therefore let's intervene. And God forbid, that is what we don't want. And that is why we must speak strongly against it. So you don't say that because there were some minor infractions some time ago, today when horrible, horrendous infractions are happening, they want to uh, rationalize and justify it. That's number one. Number two, if Nanado said he was what uh, the doyen of how do you call him doyen of what uh, democracy the, the ghana politics and uh, human rights yeah. activists the bible says to whom much is given much is what required so you claim that you were the democrat rollins was a dictator etc you understand democracy human rights etc and under your watch all these horrible atrocities are happening worse than any other time in the democratic history of this country Sometimes I pinch myself, I ask myself, is this happening in Ghana? Are we really in Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana? Is this Ghana a facilitator, a promoter, and a financier of institutional violence in this country? When this country, when they brought mercenaries from South Africa to come and train people, those are the boys that have grown and matured to become the invincible forces who are engaging in all these atrocities. As we speak now, they are training 10,000 people. 10,000 people. Look, the kinds of things that are going on in this country, it will blow your mind. Since 2017, there has not <coughs> been any formal recruitment into the Ghana Armed Forces. Quote me any day. You can go and check. You're a media person. Since 2017, there has not been the way that they do recruitment and it's processed publicly, etc. There has not been, not one. And yet, people are always getting into the army. How are they getting in there? How are they recruited? So, is it creating a private army? So, horrible things are happening. So, it is within this context that all these things are happening. And for me, one other dimension which is emerging so rapidly and with such brazen impunity is the open tribalism. I keep saying that it doesn't matter how much school you've gone to. Whether you are a professor or you are a lawyer or whatever it is, anybody who practices tribalism, your mind is not developed. You are very backward. You know why, Sarah? If when your mother and your father met, were you there? Did they ask you permission? <laughs> All of us sitting here, were we there? Were we consulted by our parents before they came together? Whether it was in the night or daytime? We were not there. You didn't decide. That you, you woke up one day and you are born, you are in Ghana. Perhaps if they had asked you, you say, okay, you want to be in Seychelles. Or you want to be in uh, New York. Or Kosomokaya, <laughs> wherever that is. You know, <laughs> the Republic of Kosovo. <laughs> you know, we, we are all here 
by an accident of nature or by divine prov providence. So whether you are Shanti, you are Ebe, you are Sisala, you are Dagomba, you are, we are all Ghanaians. And that is something we must hold strong. We've been living together. Look, my mother is Ashanti. They are, uh, uh, my father is Ashanti, sorry, they are matrilineal. I cannot inherit from there. My mother is Anglo. They are patrilineal. I cannot I I from, uh, inherit from, from there. <laughs> my, my wife is Achim. So where would my children be? Please. <laughs> God forbid. I would rather die. I would rather die. So, so, so this nonsense must stop. And the way it's being done in a brazen manner, brazen tribalism, is no longer subtle. It's open. I mean, only two days ago in, in, in uh, uh, um, New Edubiasi, an MPP assemblyman uh, who has been a, a world coordinator assemblyman for three times, he was going to register. A vice chairman of the MPP went to stop him. Why? Because he was an ever. How can we allow these things to go on? It is totally unacceptable. People who speak ever, people of northern extraction, they are being prevented from registering. Look at the demolitions. The incident in Dam uh, Banda, what are the antecedents? Because people who had been living in a particular community, who had been resettled officially by the VRA, had been given land to fish, to, so their canoes can land. They created a landing site for them. Because of politics, because they are seen as Ebers, and they probably might be voting for the NDC. Even when an institution like a Blue Dam had created a place for them, the MP goes, they send people, then go and demolish their properties. The same thing happened in Pema. Why? What, 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 where are we heading towards? And you can't tell me that human rights and they brought toward freedom. <laughs> for where? In any case, assuming that he did, and it, we give undue credit to, to, to people like that. Everybody contributed. We were all in the university those days. We all rose up. It was, it was ironic. I supported Rawlings Revolution and all that. But when the time came, we said we needed democracy. Because as a student leader, you want space to speak. So everybody contributed. In any case, whatever he, he might have done, now you have been given power. You know a man's true character when he has power. Now you've been given power. What are you doing with the power? Suppressing people, closing down radio stations, targeting the businesses of your opponents. And you have the nerve and effort to tell us this is a promoter of human rights for where? This is a dictator in shoot. He must be called out for who he is. He's a dictator. He doesn't believe in, in a liberal democracy. So, Please, this whole business about you know he's a human rights activist and all that is not true. And yeah, and I'm happy that yeah, please, yeah, please, please, yeah, please, no, please, please, no, please, 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 in, in terms I'll of I'll immediacy, no, the I'll president I'll has to write to parliament to get the ER. He has laid foundation. No. Be so head about no, 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 if, 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 make sure that Mujib, is done. Mujib, listen to me. We, I, what if I he had said you something you that, are, not, that are not factual, you could point it out. Yes. But you cannot just allege that. No, but you can't say somebody is a dictator. Is a dictator. Is a dictator. What do you mean by dictator? He's a dictator. Who is a dictator? It's not a word. It's not a word. The word dictator. Then you don't know what you are saying. Let me know. What is that? It's a word of the United States Constitution. The separation of power. You don't have to parliament. You don't. We don't have parliament. In dictatorial environment, you have parliament. He's a, he's a you are going to no, go no, to no, parliament, no, 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 no. and you are sitting here, sitting and saying, calling somebody a dictator. That is disingenuous. Are you done? Are you done? That is 
and fair. Are you done? Moji, when you are speaking, are you done? Again, you had a problem with it. Allow him to allow I'm not saying he shouldn't Please. talk, but we should speak to the issues and tell the people of Ghana the right. Thank you. Are you done? I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Can we continue and have a decent, enlightened conversation? I think it's important, and uh, Mr. Host, I think it's important that you exercise your authority because he has every opportunity to um, respond. And I would advise him to use his pen to put down his notes when he was speaking. I put down my notes. That's how we engage in enlightened discussion. Okay? Thank you. So, I'm saying that Nanado, if you look at his antecedents, before he entered parliament, that election in Chibi, it was one of the bloodiest elections ever in the history of this country. Yeah. Our parliamentary candidate then, Uruokwa Mofa, he almost lost his life. That is Nanado for you. That is why all the incidents that Mutala recounted, he has not been able to say anything. Aya was so West Wogon for me. You know, if you're a true Democrat, your party loses power. You know that that is how it's supposed to be. Your party will be in power, you lose power. So, some of us were ready to give him the benefit of the doubt. In any case, any government that comes to power must improve upon the economy or the well being of the people. So that for eight years' time, when another government comes, you don't go and start eight years behind. So, you want a government to at least have some relative success. The day I gave up on him, and I realized that all this talk about being you know, a liberal Democrat, it was a sham, it was fake. He didn't believe in democracy, and he's worse than a dictator. Was I ever so worse? Well gone. Broad daylight. You send all these guys wearing all kinds of things. In Max, broad daylight, and you had seven police officers. The IGP said he didn't know about the operation. And then, but then, junior officers under him said they were part of the operation. Ministers of State said they gave the orders. You set up a commission. Made up of eminent people, a most short, and, now, and then another person who is currently a That's Supreme Court judge. Yeah. Very serious people. They come out with recommendations. They said what the guys did was not right. Deal with them. You write a white paper, and then you cover them. Nothing has been done. Double, one of the guys who was involved in that incident, he was one of the people who joined Wafawa Yakubu to go and beat up people. So you see, if action had been taken during the Ayawa So West War gone, by election. Perhaps Hawa Yakubu would not have been emboldened to go to the polling oh, station, oh, Hawa oh, Kumsen, oh, oh, to go to the station with these guys and go and misbehave. So you see that consistently, <coughs> consistently, Nanado has been a promoter of violence. He benefits from violence. His political philosophy is based on violence. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. They are, these are the things that have been burdened and they have institutionalized it. All these boys that are all over the place there, where, where are they coming from? Are they not using state security apparatus? So it is within that context. First of all, two weeks before this incident, we did a press conference. I have it here. And in that press conference, we said, clearly, we said, we do not like any violence. We are peace-loving people, and we are calling on the security services to act, and we give them a lot of evidence. And we said, if they do not act, what is going to happen is that it's going to affect the confidence of the people in the ability of the security services to deal with issues fairly and dispassionately. And when that time comes, it will be difficult for us to control them because already we are under tremendous pressure. So it is important that the security services act with dispatch on all the issues that we had brought before them. Nothing happened. Then you have a Hawa Yakumsun, Hawa Yakumsun Hawa Kumsun. Go, going to fire guns, burning motorbikes, beating people indiscriminately, coupled with all these incidents. And then we come and tell our people, look, too much of this. The guy who was stabbed in Banda, you know the antecedents? The previous day, those same guys who committed that atrocious act went to a police station and went to disrupt the process. The police officer there got them arrested. They were sent to the police station. Within 20 minutes, they had a call, order from above. And those guys were released. 
they came back to the same police station and came to taunt the inspector even threatened that he was going to be to, to be relieved of his position he was going to be transferred our general secretary had to call the regional commander and say look is it true that you you've been the guy said they they're going to ensure that you remove this guy and the officer said well i don't have any such information or instruction these were the same guys that the following day because you see the previous day they were arrested and released based on orders from above they became emboldened and then they set, mounted a roadblock looking for ndc people and this young silas 28 year old just qualified teacher training they took him and stabbed him to death and somebody will sit here and tell us what the same things happen when is this what we want in in a, in a registration a young man has lost his life for nothing just because he was going to re re register as was sitting in a bus and you don't want us to talk about these things so what is happening is state sponsored terrorism state finance those guys are trained finance deployed by the state by state actors the evidence is overwhelming i also west was a classic case nothing has been done to them the president knows that he will benefit politically from this that is the strategy that they want to adopt to suppress votes to intimidate people why are you not there did we not hear the level of hypocrisy in this country is frightening did we not hear the boys in the Iowa suit wagon tape saying that this is a dress rehearsal for 2020 did you not hear it we heard him say it and they are manifesting this in life you know so please don't they should give us a break how Comson claimed she fired the gun by now it, it's very easy you do forensics uh, there will be girl residue on her finger you can tell whether she's telling the truth or not I know she did not fire the gun yeah. she was just trying to cover those boys and you see that is even another issue yeah. a public officer deceiving the public and if she made that statement that is also another offense deception of a public officer defend defending terror group it's unacceptable conduct. It must be condemned. And, uh, you know, I, I think you haven't followed that. For once, the, uh, the peace council were very, very, very clear. Yeah. For once, the statement, you know, in the past, even if they will speak, they will speak and equalize. And, you know, but for once, they were very direct. They said the president should sack her. She should be arrested and prosecuted. Yeah. Christian council has spoken. A Ghana Bar Association, they've just woken up, they went to sleep for a long time, you know, and other entities, they've spoken. This is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. So please, yeah. it is important that we realize that this democracy is not the prerogative of any group of people or any individual. All of us have a responsibility to ensure the sustenance of this democracy. Again, when you study consolidation of democracy, there are what we call non-state actors. Their role is critical. The media, civil society organizations, and other NGOs and research institutions, faith-based organizations, their role in the consolidation of democracy is very, very, very critical. They must continue and begin to speak up. They've been quiet for too long. Thank God they are now speaking. They should continue because, you see, at the end of the day, when the democracy is threatened, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid a million times, and there's confusion in the land, bullets don't have names written on them. No. When the bullets fly, even a stray one can hit anybody. That is why all of us must be concerned by what is going on. If these issues are not condemned and dealt with to their logical conclusion, can you imagine what will happen on December 7, 2020, when they have promised us that they are going to dish out Ayala so West World War with that with, to us with desert. And in the registration process, they are, they, are, they are exhibiting signs of it. It must be dealt with in the strongest them and condemned. And the president must be held accountable. He's the commander-in-chief. He's the head of security. He cannot uh, uh, run away from that responsibility. Thank now, uh, please, come, final point there in London. Yes, uh, so, briefly. so um, I, I read the press, press statement uh, the other time, and we spoke extensively about all the issues and then we stated that, and I, I, I remember exactly what I said, I have the videos here, and that the majority of the security services are professional people. They're doing a very good job, and we don't have a problem with them. And that, but those recalcitrant ones who are collaborating 
with the MPP and are naming people, they should bear in mind that if nothing happens to them, if they are not brought to book, when we come to power, we're going to fish them out and deal with them. And before that, we said, we expect, we don't believe that the president will be able to do anything to Hawa Yakubu. But he should disappoint Hawa Kumsu. He should, he, should, he should disappoint us and dismiss her and allow her to be persecuted. If that does not happen, come 2021, we will deal with her according to the full regards. And let me read what Sami said, which some people are mischievously misinterpreting. He said, notice is hereby served to all unscrupulous security officials who have lent themselves to the despotic Akufuado government as pliant agents of violence against innocent citizens. That the next NDC government will fish them out and deal with them according to the full rigors of the law. Where in this has Sami Jemfi or myself said that the NDC is going to deal with all the security officials? There's nothing, there's nothing here. Don't forget that we had stated a preamble that majority of the members of the security services are professionals who are doing a very good job. In fact, they are not happy with what is going on. You think that a serving military officer who has spent all his career 20, 30, 40 years in the army has gone through discipline, has built a reputation for himself and for the entity that he serves. He is happy that some thugs will go for training for four to six weeks and wear their uniform and go and beat innocent people. They are not happy. And let me tell you, they are not happy with what is going on. So we will come and bring sanity. There will be no situation where any thug will wear police uniform, wear military uniform, and go and misbehave in their name. We will clean it out. But the seven officers who are doing a good job, there is no problem. So those who think that, and don't forget that the military people are very, very intelligent. So this desperate attempt to divert attention and make it look like, oh, Sami Jemfi said that we're going to deal with all the military people, please, is bogus. Okay. It's not true. It's here. It's here. That maybe it's the language that he used that maybe the English is very high. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so we know. So maybe he should have said it in, you know, you know remember that uh, Makola woman, he said, Nanado should speak there. I am going to come English. Yes. Maybe <laughs> we'll use that going forward. Because when you said, you know, unscrupulous security officials, Somebody might think he's talking about all, oh, but unscrupulous means unscrupulous. And it's just a few of them, less than 1%, who are doing those things. They are the ones we are talking about. But more importantly, more importantly, are those thugs who are being hired, picked up, trained for three, four weeks, and then they've been armed, they wear them uniforms, and they are terrorizing people. No properly trained security official will behave like that. Okay. Those are the ones we are talking okay. about. We are talking about pliant agents of violence. Are all the security officers uh, uh, okay. unleashing violence on Ghanaians? No. Okay. So we are talking about that small cohort of people within the security services and largely those tonton macutes that have been trained and are working around Thank causing you. problems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Free uh, How do you pick farm says protecting yourself by firing a gun when your opponents were not armed? Nana Bribohin once said they will use their police and military to beat anyone who will stop the EC from conducting the new register. In recent time, most MPP supporters seem to think and believe that they can use the police and military to intimidate the great NDC supporters because they have control over them and can use them whichever and whatever way they feel. The MPP should not think everyone in the police or military is a card-bearing member of their party. Neither should they think every security man will follow their direction like ships. Uh, then uh, this one is from Komla Genya, who says Mujib says he doesn't like to equalize, but he's doing exactly that. Anyway, I don't envy him at all. He has no choice but defend the indefensible to please his party. Uh, that's from Komla Denya. Um, let me just read one from Davis Sena who says, uh, Do you expect President Akufuado to take action against his and his party's chief fundraiser, Hawa Kumsin, who has the Ministry of Special Presidential Initiative? You know the NPP and money. Thank you. Ama. Speaking briefly on Professor Mills, you know, because yesterday there was a whole event that was organized um, to remember him and, and what he stood for. I remember when the sad incident happened. Um, it was at a time when I was not, sorry, I was not in Ghana. <coughs> I'd, <coughs> I'd quit my job at the bank and I'd gone back to school at the time. And I remember that I had, you know, um, 
being with a group of friends, Nigerian friends at the time when the call came in. And when I'd been told, surprisingly, because I still can't explain <laughs> the emotions that sort of overtook me at that time. I just remember crying, you know. And I remember my, my Nigerian friends making fun, fun of me and saying, how can you be crying because the pres your president is dead? And they couldn't imagine themselves crying because their the president, president was dead, you know. <laughs> and I, 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 me, myself, I was shocked at my own reaction. I did not expect, you know, to overcome my emotions the mm. way that I was. And so yesterday, you know, having the final opportunity to be present at the venue, you know, and to sort of be able to properly um, show some respect to him, I, I was happy. And I think that it's happening at a very good time, you know, um, us having to remember Professor Mills, who he stood for, you know, um, the Sumdre Pact. I think at this time today in our, in our uh, politics, it's very necessary. I think that all of the players, you know, both the NDC and the MPP, should take a cue, you know, uh, from the good professor what he stood for, his insistence on peace, and the fact that today every Ghanaian, regardless of your political affiliation, appreciates who Professor Mills, you know, um, I say is, I refuse to use words, is, and his essence in our politics. The fact that perhaps at that time we may not have understood his overemphasis uh, over on Asumdre, but today all of us agree that it was very necessary that all of us would take a cue from that and appreciate that politics is, uh, what's the word? Transient. It comes and goes. If there's something I love about my Ghana, it's the fact that we can easily change the baton with no sweat. We can easily say that, thank you, sit down, let the you know, next one come and try. Yeah. It's, and I would say this, it's unfortunate that it's always just NDC and MPP, right? However, yeah. Indeed, we have, ex we, we have shown as a people that we don't have any difficulty to say, enough, sit down, let the next person come and try. So I would use this, you know, to extend a note to all our political players that perhaps that assumption that the good professor spoke about all the time, this would be the time for all of us to consider it and think of our legacy for tomorrow. Nobody's going to live forever. You're going to go away. How are we going to remember you? Would anybody, would let any girl or woman sit on TV on a fine Saturday morning and reference you with peace when you are, when you are gone? So I want all our political players to think about the legacy that they will leave behind once they are done with whatever it is they are doing and use the good professor as a reference point. That, that's just, you know, um, to show him yeah. respect. Now, let me move on to this issue about... Um, the minister and firing guns, you know, at a polling station. Here, I'll talk about my personal experience. On the day that we started the mass registration, which I personally find unnecessary for reasons that have been overemphasized, and so I will not go over, you know, the fact that this is COVID-19. Our president himself says that it's, it's not ordinary times. These are not ordinary times. Our president has over and over and over admonished us to appreciate the times we are in and act accordingly to the extent that our president for the first time has had need to even tell us about the food we should eat. I should tell you that this is not normal times. Mm. Have you ever heard in the history of anywhere where the president is telling the citizens what to eat? <laughs> so if we are here now in a time that all of us are doing our best to contain a world pandemic, that is wiping out populations of people. I felt that this is not the time for a mass voters registration, for all the dangers it poses for all of us. So that's one, my personal opinion. But we are here. We have to do it. And so how do we do it so that, and yesterday somebody said something that, you know, I thought was very interesting. The person said to me, Amma, well, not Amma, he said in a room that, at this time, when people are dealing with COVID-19 and the loss of jobs, you know, and having to deal with their kids in their house and all of that, this is not the time to trouble anybody with any extra drama. So for me, I thought that we would have done everything to ensure that this is as seamless and as smooth as possible. You just go there, you do what you have to do, you go home peacefully, 
no stress, no drama, done. Because first of all, we are having to deal with the thought of possible death <laughs> just by going to register. That by itself is daunting enough. Now, here I am, you know, journalist. You know, I work here at Pan African TV. Um, gone to a registration, I mean, a couple of registration centers trying to see what was happening, putting together a, a, a production to show Ghanaians that, oh, it's not bad. Let's go out and register. Let's do the best that we can. And we were confronted by a lady who identified her. So first of all, they told us that she was at the MPP rep at the station. Those that, um, I want to remember the name of the polling station. Uh, sorry? Accra. Accra High. Sorry, and that's him. That's the cameraman that was slapped, actually. He's the one behind the camera. So we, we went there to the Accra High polling station. We asked to speak. Of course, everywhere we go to, we asked to speak to the party reps. We asked to speak to the EC officials and all of that. So we we're pointed to the NPP reps. Then the NPP reps spoke to us, told us what was going, the process so far, how they felt about it. The NPP reps refused to speak to us, said we will not speak to you, go on, go on. So we went away, went on to speak to the EC officials who were very cooperative, we spoke to everything was done. Suddenly, this lady who was with the NPP uh, 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 reps charges at us that we had filmed her without her consent, and so she wanted our camera. She wanted our camera. So I spoke to her. I said, no, we will not give you our camera. Nobody has filmed you. Why would we film you? First of all, why would we film you? So that ensued for a bit. Before anybody could say, Ja, this lady was slapping this very cameraman behind this camera, this gentleman this, in the black this chair. Man. This man. <laughs> he was, she was slapping him. <coughs> And she told us that she's national security and she would deal with us. And the whole time I was thinking to myself, imagine. So when I heard about this incident, first of all, uh, I, I don't even know what to say. I was not surprised and that by itself is problematic. I should be surprised. Because this is Ghana. And here, I reference Ayawasu Central again. I like to always speak from my point of view. That morning, I sent a crew out. And I remember the driver saying to me, hey, I don't want to go. I've never covered, because he was new at the time. I've never covered the election. Hey, he's going. I'm like, come on, this is Ghana. Nothing happens, you know, um, at these things. Well, it's fine, go. And they went to Ayawasu. And what happened, happened. And I would say that I personally took part in that demonstration. I went there myself. I wore my, my black t-shirt. I wore my black and red tracks, and I went there. Because I felt that as a Ghanaian, I needed to let my voice be heard. And I needed to let the political players understand that this is not acceptable. If I go to the polling station, I will not have NDC on my forehead. I will not have NPP on my forehead. I will just go there in my normal clothes, probably in a blue dress like I'm wearing this morning. Now, if anybody decides to throw, you know, <laughs> and a bullet which is not even intended for me hits me, so I hope you appreciate what I'm saying. Every Ghanaian is at risk. That's, that's because you don't know which polling station is going to turn dramatic at any point in time. And I refuse to let this be the reason why I will not exercise my right to vote. Because this is a right that has been won for me through struggle. It didn't come easy. The right for every Ghanaian's voice to be heard is not something <coughs> that came on a silver platter for which I should take for granted. It is a right that I have that I intend to fully enjoy. And so I will do that. I will go to the polling station and I will register and I will go there and I will vote. I have to. Because if I sit aloof and the wrong leaders are chosen, I will suffer. Not just me, my children will suffer. In fact, the generation after my children will suffer for it. And so I have to go there and I have to make my vote count. And so instead of because of the sitting back aloof, I would rather register my protest so that the right thing is done. 
Because the right thing needs to be done. Now, let me say that I totally agree that this is about institutionalized violence. Because as we sit here today, what has happened? How has my government shown me leadership by bringing to book the people who perpetuated this violence? How has my government shown me that we are not in support of this action? That we have your back? Nothing has been done. There was a paper that was issued. I don't want to go into all of that. We all know what happened with it. Now, for me, this Howard Kumsen incident takes it a notch higher. She's a member of the executive. The executive arm of government. So now do you understand what I'm saying? She's not just any hoodlum that was picked from the street. She's not any party boy that was put into national security that's misbehaving. This is an executive member. For her to boldly say that I got up in the morning wanting to go witness the registration process. And in the process, I put a gun in my pocket, a loaded gun in my pocket. That gives me chills. So I'm not only at the mercy of a few miscreants. So now, am I to deduce from this that this is the thinking of my governing elite, for want of a better expression? Am I supposed to deduce that this is how my executive views the process and how to conduct the process? So this gives me chills. Now let's look at this issue of self-defense. And I like the fact that, you know, Mutala um, referenced his LLB. I will reference my LLB too. We were all told that there are elements of self-defense. Obviously, an unprovoked attack, you know, um, the uh, expectation of uh, the, the threat of violence, you know, injury, personal injury, death, all of these things. But the one that I will never leave my mind, and I remember this very, very well, is the degree of force. So that the degree of force you are using in your self-defense should never outweigh or be more than the force that you, you are perceiving to, or the threat you are perceiving to be coming your way. Now, you went there with your own security. Uh, I don't know how to even. Security team, yes. You went there with your detail, lawfully or unlawfully. You went there with your own boys who were armed as, you know, a minister of state with police present and all of that. First of all, what threat? Where's the eminent threat, first of all? And how do you explain that your pulling of a gun is proportionate to that threat that you felt? And so, please, let, let, sometimes, let's say things to make the rest of us feel that our leadership has respect and faith in us. Let's not just throw things out there. Let's look at this issue of, and here, because I'm a woman and because I'm a gender activist and because I always speak for the women. Let me say that the woman factor is very important to me. Okay. Now, in all of these um, discussions that have followed this issue, people have said, oh, or ban or ban, and I refuse to go along with that because I feel that if the men do it is wrong, if the women do it is wrong, let's not overemphasize because it's a woman. Because men have been perpetuating violence forever, nobody has said anything. If a woman perpetuates to, let's address the violence and not the fact that she's a woman. However, I will be the first to also admit that sometimes, because we have this issue hanging on our necks, this issue of women representation, and how we are constantly advocating for more women to have a seat at the table, as women, when we do have a seat at the table, we have a right to behave better and be above board. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to all the women behind us and all the young girls that will come after us that when we are given the opportunity, as women, we behave better. 
and we show that ah, when women have the chance, they sanitize the system. Women will never be prone to violence. Women are the best. And so when these things happen, say now, I am pained. I get upset. Because you give everybody the chance to say, oh, don't mind them. They are the same. Or they are worse in this instance. How? How are you pulling a gun? Let me just say that I totally agree with Mr. Obviously Free and when he says that equalization is not the answer. Equalization is never the answer. As a Ghanaian, I'm tired of, and you people did it in this place, and that people did it in those places, and we also did, no, don't, don't give me those stories. Let's move forward. If we appreciated it when it was done there, you wouldn't be here. So let, let's move forward. And in saying that, I would say that I did not appreciate the NDC's call for self-defense too. I did not. I would have hoped that the NDC would have stayed on bring perpetrators to book. I would have appreciated that call better than a call for self-defense. Because, say now, me, anybody who knows me will tell you that I'm a very calm, very reserved person. I'm never in your face. I'd rather sit in the corner and watch. I never expected that that day at Dakra High Secondary School, when that woman slapped the cameraman, I would jump literally from the van and latch at her. I never expected to do that. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever imagine. And I don't know if you've seen the videos, if you saw the woman, that I would even think to go at her. That woman can squash me in two seconds. Like she can literally do this to me and I'm, and I'm gone. But in that moment, to see her slap and, and, you know, perhaps because I happen to be general manager here and I feel a responsibility towards the people who were here, to see her slap him, the emotions that just, you know, I just saw myself jumping from the van and headed her way. No thoughts. So I feel that in such situations, already there's the human instinct when you are witnessing an injustice to react already. I feel that that's already there. So even without the NDC calling on its members to self-defend, th there's a tendency for people to want to do that. So I would have wished that the NDC would have rather called for people in those instances to be calm and show, um, I know that Mr. F uh, Mr. Frank, I would totally disagree with but I'll still say it. I would have hoped, <laughs> I know that he totally disagree with me, but I'll still say it. With, with, with your permission, right? Please, sure. So, you see, we, we just didn't say that out of the vacuum. We had given copious instances with evidence and told the police, do something to give us confidence. Now a young man was stabbed to death. I mean, if you were your brother, you know, you just put yourself in the shoes of young people who go out there. So if you, if you, you, you were, your, your guy was attacked, the next time another team was attacked, wouldn't you tell them, tell him when you are going, go in a group and protect yourselves. That is the context. You understand? We are not calling for violence. Yeah. We have stated it very clearly that we want peace. We want the security services to do their job. Yeah. But to the extent that people are now being murdered, I think we should be careful. Okay. So that's the context. So I appreciate Thank you. this. Thank you I really much. truly appreciate this. To call for protection is the way to go. I totally appreciate this. So if you say, when you are going there, protect yourself. I'm with you 100. Let's protect ourselves. Everybody needs to protect themselves. And you don't protect yourself <laughs> by having a gun too. So I would now call on government, and here I would also call on the president, and say that as a child, and I've said this every opportunity that I have been given, as a child, I was an icon. I grew up on him. His human rights um, activism, you know, um, the representation of him as somebody who fought for our rights, you know, his eloquence. And I had opportunity to witness him first and for myself, you know, at rallies and demonstrations and things like that. And so, to say that I am disappointed by all that is happening now would be an understatement. Because I really truly expected way better. I truly expected 
with it. So I'm calling on Mr. Daphne. I'm calling on the president to show leadership now. Show us leadership. Let's know that we have a government in power that has our interest at heart. Election violence is not for us as government. Mm -hmm. This is not us. We call ourselves the gateway to Africa. We are known globally as that peaceful country that can easily change political players with ease, no violence, nothing. We've had President Barack Obama choose to come here instead of go to his native Kenya because of our peaceful transition through an election. It's important that in our poverty, this is a third, you know, a world country, that even in our poverty, we have the pride of peace as a people. Ghanaians have always pride ourselves as that peaceful country. Look around us. All the things that are happening in the sub region. Some of it is touching us as Ghanaians. And as a Ghanaian, I hold myself proud anywhere I go. You see that my country is peaceful. Hmm. So please, let's not do this. Let's not disgrace ourselves. Let's not take away this pride that the average Ghanaian holds so dearly. Just because people want political power. It makes me shudder that for political power, people are willing to shoot guns and kill people. I think I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that uh, should be ending our discussion on this whole issue. But we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll move on to the other issues that we are supposed to, that we'll be discussing. Doing. Tuesday to Friday, 7.30 to 9 o'clock p.m. every day. You should be watching The Couch. I'll tell you why. On Tuesdays, we talk social issues, lifestyle, health, all those everyday issues that affect us in the big ways. Let's Wednesdays are for book reviews. Thursdays are for the hard talk, those social, economic, policy-oriented, political questions that demand for the tough questions to be asked. Our personality profiling Fridays, when we get to know the stories behind the winning personalities we love. Inspirational story from inspirational personalities. Hey, listen, you really cannot miss the couch with me, Amma, but still, the only TV show with a hat. Morning is an important time of the day because how you spend your morning can often tell you what kind of day you're going to have. I want you to have a great day. So start your day with me because I can guarantee a great show every weekday on Good Morning Africa right here on Pan-African Television. I will be serving some inspiration, news, business, health, newspaper review, music, and so much more. Join me, Kwame. Kwame Owusu Danso on Good Morning Africa on Pan African Television. Let's have a truly African morning. Medasi. Market Stories is all about our market. Issues such as sanitation, market structures, storage facility, transit, bargaining, and everything else that goes on in the market. It's going to be very educative, entertaining, and interactive. We would visit our various markets to both sellers and buyers to know everything concerning our market. Join me. My name is Maud Ya Ananinati. I'm your market lady.
has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the redeemer and the champion of liberty of human Come back from that break. If you just join us, you're watching the Mother World Talk Shows. Alaji and Alaji, we are live on Pan African TV. We are live on several affiliates across the country, including Global FM, our major radio partner within the Greater Accra region. In Sahunto 92.3 FM. A big thank you to those of you watching us on Facebook. Just a few comments before we move on to the next topic. Musa Abato and Kumasi is saying, I found Mujib's arguments un untenable. All the discretions that ha have been given to how Kumsin's unethical behavior were not coming from NDC. According to Professor Was, for example, you are spot on. Only politicians who have their heads screw on, uh, okay, uh, justifying how Kumsin's action. And Dr. Kwesini also said that how Kumsin's actions is disgraceful and a threat to the peace and security of this country. If President Kufado doesn't support violence, ac violent activities going on, why is he quiet? Um, okay, so this one is coming from, okay, I think I've read. Okay, so, Denise Akuti says, the attitude of Madam Hao Kumsin was distasteful, despicable, barbaric, and nauseating. However, even though it is within the right of the NDC to urge their members to dispose themselves to self-defense in the face of extreme provocation, I think some of his leadership should tread cautiously in order not to give room to their opponents to take them out of contest by strategic selective approach in subjecting their comments to critique, as they are currently doing to Comrade Sami Jefi. That said, Mujib should know that self-defense has to happen within certain environment, and where there exists an evidence of premeditation as clearly can be deduced on the conduct of Madame Hawa, the remedy of self-defense would not suffice. Uh, thank you for that message. Um, okay, now let me go to Facebook and read a few more of the messages you are sending to that. Before that, let me read a message from Senator Bright in Dansuma. We say, Senator, please tell. Okay, uh, this is okay. It, he said, please tell Mujib to redraw his comment he made. The viewers of this program are not discerning. He said it's, okay. I, I don't think he said that. Yeah, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. Uh, he said, then he continues to say, it's a fact that Nanado is m more than a dictator. He's behaving as if he came to power uh, through coup d'etat. The president has clearly shown that he is lawless and a violent person. We shall defend ourselves now with anything at our disposal. And then, like, uh, let me just read a few of the uh, comments on Facebook, and then I'll, we'll move on to the next topic. Mr. Haruna says, a person trusts Nanado and his appointees at his, at his own peril. When the issue of Radio Gold and Radio XYZ came up, Nanado went pled to intervene. He said he had no locus to speak to that matter, <coughs> and that they should sort it out at the communications ministry. So the question is, what has changed now that he can order the communications ministry to act according to his words? Uh, he sent that junior sender from uh, Agona or Dobin Zongo. Abi Bantu says, Good morning. Why, okay, why is Mujib speaking like as if he is coming from space? Ghana has never witnessed such level of violence, terrorism, with impunity, ordinary Ghanaians. Why is all the COVID 19 monies, 54 million Ghana cities for food, just three weeks? Hey, MPP and stealing. The create loot and share. Akufuado is, okay. The Ghanaians and NDC must defend themselves from Akufuado's hoodlums, fake police and fake soldiers. Defend yourself, my people. Ruka Abu Akar says, in order to go back to court, even in America, there's a ticket holders are okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the messages you are sending uh, to us. Move on to the next topic for discussion. Because on Thursday, we, 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 we had the media budget review. I'm going to take the thoughts of the, my panel today on what they heard. And I will start once again with Comrade. Well, le let me say that it's constitutionally required that every year a financial statement is made to the people of this country. And the reason why this thing is always made in Parliament is that they can't gather everybody in Ghana and make the statement to us. The expectation is that once the financial statement is presented before the 275 members of parliament we have, they would then also inform their people as uh, so to what the plan expenditure of government is and the expected revenue in the coming year. And that is why the presentation is always done before the 
I mean, always precedes the coming year for which that budget plan is going to be used. Now, the planned expenditure, it is planned because you would have known what you intend to do. It's just like if you have a child, you have three kids, they have vacated school and they're about to resume for the beginning of the year. You would have known how much you are paying as school fees. You would have known at least calculated the amount of money you can give to these students for school each year. You would have known the kinds of things you do. So the expenditure is always planned. But the revenue is expected. What it simply means is that you may have targets that you get revenue to be able to take care of the expenditure. That target may fail you. If your expenditure, for example, is 1 million Ghana cities, and then you expect to get, let's say, 1.2 million Ghana cities to be able to run that, then you can, and then at the end of the day, if you succeed in getting the 1.2 million, that is what you would have, you would have what the economists describe as surplus budget. Now, if what you expect to run or to be able to meet the expenditure, 1 million, then you got 1 million to be able to execute that. That is a balanced uh, budget. But where you are expecting 1.1 1 .1 million to take care of the expenditure, the planned expenditure of 1 million, and you happen to get, let's say, 800 or 700 Ghana cities, you are not able to get the 1 million. It's a deficit what, budget. And every year, it seems to me in this country, that is what we have experienced almost all the time. Years gone by, 50% or almost 50% of our budgets were always donor funded or supported. Until 2000 and sometime 2013, 2014 going, that quote and unquote, a middle income status of Ghana, that they felt that they better give such assistance to countries that were so in need of those resources. So you will realize each year we have to try to mobilize enough resources to be able to meet our, our planned expenditure or meet our budgetary support. Of course, we still get some donor funded projects or support, but to what extent? And in recent economic you know, development, donors no longer give you everything. They will give you part and expect you to raise the other part to be able to execute the projects. Now, in the country in the world, a major source of revenue to be able to meet the expenditure of the state is, is taxation major source. There are other sources to which you can mobilize the needed revenue to be able to execute your projects. Now, the, the sharp difference between the developed and, and, the, and, 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 the, and the undeveloped countries, or if you like, the middle income, is that whereas we get out of the taxation, we get almost 80% of the revenue we get from taxation, from the indirect taxes, the import duties, the export duties, the you know, income deductions. And then we get just a paltry sum of the revenue we get from taxation from the direct taxes. That is the income that duties and the profits that companies make. Whereas in the developed world, to a very large extent, they mobilize their revenue from the direct taxes and not the indirect taxes. But you see, with regards to indirect taxes, the one paying the tax is not the one who bears the final brunt of the tax he pays. If I am an importer and I bring in goods and the taxes at the ports are higher, I simply add the tax to the goods. That will help me determine the price I'll sell it. And then I'll still make a, a profit. At the end of the day, the ordinary man, the final consumer who consumes those goods, bear the brand of what? Of the tax. Now, if you look at the budget that was presented, that each year when you present the budget, Parliament approves the budget, you still do not have the right to spend until you have what they call the appropriation bill which is then approved, giving you the authority to go ahead and what? And spend. Now, sadly, our democracy expect that after the budget is presented, members of parliament need to go to their constituents where proper practices of parliamentary democracy. You need to go to your constituents to let them understand the plans government has, the kind of projects that government intend to execute, where they are getting the money. For example, if in the budget which was presented, there is going to be a road in Tamale Central, or a rehabilitation of existing roads in Tamale Center, or a building of something like that, I would have to go and meet my constituent and let them understand. This is how much is factored into this project, A, B, C, D. Of course, you can't get everybody in your constituency contributing towards the debate, but at least you can have a town hall meetings 
or a means by which you can solicit the views of people. That should inform you in the debate. Because once the budget is presented, at least they will start the debate sometime Tuesday mm -hmm. or next week. Yeah. That would inform. Unfortunately and sadly, these things are not being done in the dem kind of democracy we practice here. Yeah. So you find people who are completely insulated from such budgetary presentation and the kind of inputs that MPs are expected to make because their views are not solicited in a way by their representation. Maybe we need to take a second look at these issues. Now, every year, when you present the budget, now we have what we call the media budget which was presented. It means that half of the year, you can come with a budget indicating these were the projections we made. These were the things we expected to, to execute, the projects and programs. And these were the revenues we were expecting. And the media budget prints a picture of the budget you presented, your inability to do A, B, C, D, and why you couldn't do those things, and what you intend to do. Now, if you look at the budget that was presented, it came with a lot of plagiarism, complete plagiarism, that was demonstrated without the decency to acknowledge. The reason why this thing is critical is academic theory. And the president in his inaugural speech did seem plagiarized about four heads of state. And he, he said it as if it was his own. When you do this, and young people who are watching you, what kind of lesson are you giving to those young people? You are telling them that, oh, okay, there is nothing wrong with stealing the, 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 the intellectual property of anybody. Now, what I expected the minister to do is that even when we plagiarize, at least acknowledge. Acknowledge a speech that was delivered in 1910. As, as, late, as, as early as 1910, 1910, I really don't think that the president himself was, was alive. Acknowledge that. And he didn't do that. He said it, and everybody was clapping for him. Everybody said, oh, this minister has done very well. And you see, it tells you that if you want to take the time to scrutinize speeches that are delivered by appointees of this government, I can bet my last penny that every other speech would have been fraught with a lot of copied and TV intellectual. And that is not a good lesson that we give to our young ones. Because if you read the context, it's a speech that Theodora Roosevelt, and it was entitled The Man in the Arena. Read the original speech and read the lines that the minister presented. And you would just come to the conclusion that he copied that without acknowledging. Now, if you have our ministers and the president himself who is engaged in side things, then it will, will be a subject of embarrassment. Then you tell young kids that, look, you don't even need to study. You just need to copy. And that, for me, is unacceptable. And the earlier, embarrassingly, these people apologize to the people of this country, the better. Another issue is that the minister raised in the budget. He indicated that they spend about $3.2 billion in free SHS. Now, this government has borrowed about 130 billion going 130 billion and any time you raise issues my good friends in the other side of the table and i think that on this platform my brother mujib would never speak speak with and i can bet my last penny when he is given the opportunity to speak there is no way he would escape mentioning free sh's any time at all you point out to them how much they have borrowed and there's nothing to show they point to free sh's they said, oh, yes, we have borrowed so much, we spend the money on free, H free SHS. When the minister himself indicated that they spent $3.2 billion so far in the free SHS, again, it also exposed the deceit in this government. Because repeatedly they have said that as a result of the free SHS, more and more students have had the opportunity to go into senior secondary school. We have just had the first badge of the free SHS students. And Mujib, the number is less the number of students sitting for the SH, the final exam, is less as compared to what we had in 2016. There is another very important point that they repeatedly mention, without telling the good people of this country, the disaster that those actions are being made on our health delivery and our intellectual and human resource you know, building in this country. The restoration of the nursing training allowances. Now you see, as recent as as, uh, 20, in fact, specifically, 24 February 19, uh, 2017. Mujib, I hope you are listening. The Ghana Midwifery and Nurses Council had their annual conference in Nanado's home region, in Koforidua, 
that is Eastern region. And in their communique, they indicated we had a deficit of 38,000 nurses. What it simply means is that we needed 38,000 more nurses to be able to meet the WHO standard of nurses patient ratio, 38,000. That was on the 24th of February 2017. This government, because it was a un super, in fact, uncontrollable, egoistic campaign promise, which was made in the 2016. Nanado didn't consider the consequences of that promise on health delivery in this country. He made that promise, and he needed to fulfill the promise. So when he came, regardless the 24th February 2017, the communique and the position taken by the Ghana nurses and midwifery council that we needed more, about 38,000 more nurses to be able to meet WHO standard. They implemented the so-called restoration of nursing training allowances with a quota. Kolebu had the, the nursing training college there, had the capacity to admit about 300 or more students a year. 2017, they admitted less than 100, 100 students. Go to all the nursing training colleges. You know the consequences. Mm. The consequences are that, at the end of the day, and the already deficit of... You have to learn for me in two minutes. Yeah. The, oh, the consequences are that the already deficit of nurses that we have is going to be overstretched. Some nurses will, will retire. Some will stop the, 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 the service. Some, by God's creation, some will die. So what it means is that there's a stretch again on the nurse-patient ratio. Go and look at the teacher training, training colleges. You restored the, the, the allowances. People are now paying fees to be admitted. And the fees are about three times the allowance that you, you, you are giving them. Now, they pay the fees. You restore it with a quota. Tamale Teacher Training College, for example, could admit as many as 200 plus students a year. A year, they are now admitting less than that. Or even 300 students a year. They are now admitting less than that. So the facilities that were provided to take care of that, what we are simply doing is that you are taking us back to the people-teacher syndrome, where you would have less trained teachers to man the institutions. Ironically, by the very government who says it's implementing free SHS. Now, why would they teach? Because if you have a trained teacher, an untrained teacher, I would prefer a trained teacher to teach my kids than an untrained teacher. And that is what this government is doing. So the NDC position at the time was that, look, we have upgraded the teacher training colleges and the nursing training colleges to tertiary level. Now, give them loans so that they have the choice if they want to take the loans. But with that, the number quadrupled, the number of admission into nursing training colleges and teacher training colleges. Now, they restore the allowance. Your job is not guaranteed. When I was at the teacher training college, by the time I completed, our persons were already out. So your postings are already out before you finish. This government came, then they tell them, okay, we restored allowances that you are now paying so much fees. Mm. Now your, your job is not guaranteed. When you finish, you have to do national service. After national service, you write the, the right. licensure exams. And after that, we are not under any compulsion to give you jobs. Yeah. Now between that, one last point. Now if you had TATCO, for example, I'm using TATCO because that was the teacher training college I attended. TATCO, assuming TATCO had the capacity to, uh, to admit 300 students, I have two other siblings. We are all qualified to be admitted into a teacher training college. Maybe I had aggregate 10. My kid brother got aggregate 8. Another brother got aggregate 7, for example. We all applied. TATCO is given a quota. And the number of people who have aggregate 7 and below and above are more than those who have aggregate 8 and 10. What it means is that I won't get the opportunity to be admitted. My other kid brother won't get the opportunity to be admitted. So it's only one brother who would have the opportunity to be admitted. Now, does it even make sense in a country that is implementing free SHS? Last point, so that I can learn. You see, when a government comes out to say that they have created more jo jobs, and I just went and Googled, and you can get it on the Ghana st the statistical service, their, even their website about job creation in this country. Now, if you look at the, the facts available about job creation in Ghana, and I'll just show you something. When you implement a policy that is geared towards creating a job, you can implement a policy this year and get the results this year. It will take you like the next year and the next two. That is when you get the direct impact of the policies that you have implemented. 
In 2015, the unemployment rate was 6.81 percent. That's 2015. So now, 2016, the unemployment rate reduced to 5.45 percent. So what it means is that the 2015 was the result of the 2016 good. Now, if you take 2000 and so it's 2016, there are a lot of policy interventions by the NDC administration. 2017, the unemployment rate reduced to 4.22 percent. MPP certainly cannot take credit for that reduction. It is as a result of the 2016 impacted in the 2017. But let's get to 2018. So 2017, it reduced from 2016, it was 5.45, reduced in 2017, that's a 4.22. Now, 2018, the unemployment rate reduced further to 4.16. So one can say that the interventions of the government occasioned the reduction of the unemployment in 2018. But let's look at 2019. 2019, the unemployment rate rose from 4.1 to 4.33. Now, you see, the lies that was peddled with NAPCO, government claimed that they recruited 100,000 people. Let's do the simple arithmetic. 100,000 people, and they also stated that they were paying each beneficiary 700 Ghana cities, if you look at the structure. Mm -hmm. Now, multiply 100,000 by 700,000 a year, that will give you 70 million. Multiply 70 million by 12, it will give you 840 million. Mm -hmm. Check the 2018 financial statement. What was the allocation for NAFCO? And in the mid-year budget, NAFCO was not even mentioned. Running the government is not like I, I do my private business on the street. That is why I made mention of the approval of the budget okay. and the approval of the appropriation bill. So simply, they never recruited 100,000 people. They lied to the people of this country. No. I'm saying that, hold on, I'm saying 2018. Now, they never recruited 100,000 people. They never even recruited 70,000 people. Because why would you say you recruited 100,000 when you do the simple arithmetic? And mind you, 2018 included the setting up of offices. Okay. You had 400 million Ghana uh, cities as the budget. So, uh, that's 30 it. seconds. So, that was a complete deceit. And in any case, if you claim that planting for food and jobs, and NAPCO has created the needed job, why is it that the unemployment rate is rising? Okay. Thank you. What you? The reverse way. <laughs> so now you did that. Yeah. Yeah. So that means that I don't have to <laughs> make a comment before you. So you go. <laughs> uh, I don't have to go in first. I don't have to go in first. No, but you don't know need to have a problem. Because so, uh, so it's so three one. So what three one? It's three one. Yeah, so now uh, I think with the uh, history, historical background, uh, Mutala has done on that, but I think uh, it was on the specifics that he was just not trying to, to, to be sincere. But <laughs> it's a constitutional requirement the uh, uh, minister has to perform on the behalf of the president, and that was exactly done. But when you look at it, it is also true that the, a lot of areas that uh, we've been accused, or the opposition has been accusing government of not paying attention. When you look at the media budget review, uh, review then you clearly understand that sometimes we just want to uh, play the usual politics and not to face the truth of the, the issues. But be it as is me, as my brother said, in terms of the NAPCO, but the idea was we all admit that unemployment has been a situation, a problem in this country for a period now. What do we do? So what do we need to do at a point People finish schools, universities, polytechnics, and various uh, tertiary institutions. But difficult to get employment immediately after their national service. You go back to sit in the house for a very long time, only God knows when you get a job. And so now any very serious and visionary government will think about this particular group of people. It wasn't a surprise that at a point they need, they came together and formed what we call the unemployment uh, association in yeah. this country. They are still there. They are still there, but hardly you hear from them now. But you see, that yeah, was it an, an, it an intervention of NAPCO. And you and I, we finish school, so sit in the house without expecting anything can be very frustrating at a point. So this was the reason that informed government and said, Fine. what do we do? It is not a permanent, but let's create a situation that you come <coughs> on board, maybe you stay while still looking for a permanent job. And it's a very good... Okay, I, yeah. I just want to...
Yeah, yeah no, you, you have it. Muji, why is it that youth employment is not recruiting? The paid internship, why is it not recruiting? Yet, the communication service tax money comes to youth employment in hundreds of millions of dollars. So NAPCO is just uh, rebranding uh, the paid internship model no, of the youth employment. Uh, uh, youth employment is not recruiting. recruiting, yes. Oh, my, man. Yeah. Who? Man, man. The internship have they recruited. Oh. Okay, so that was the Where idea. But point even point? that, uh, I'm not allowed, I sometimes try to restrain myself of, uh, myself of going into the hard political issue. Even when you are talking of the youth employment, mm -hmm. we can, you know the history. It was also born out of the frustrations of graduates and students in this country. Under the leadership of President Kufo, something again ought to be done to take care of the unemployment. Because after research, we were told that Ghana was on time bomb because the unemployment rate, rate was growing higher, higher. So something urgent needed to be done. And this was how all these <coughs> critical policies were formulated and implemented. Thank God it is still there and it's serving the purpose. Nope. So likewise, likewise, Nabku, you know, even the implementation, it met, it, it met with criticisms. Some independent minds think that, no, it is going to put much pressure on government pay. So therefore, it should be looked at. Even those people's voices are still <coughs> being heard today. But it is part of our body that we can't do without. We need to find out and make sure that we take care of those people. And I also... For the first time, we agreed together that <laughs> project uh, policy implementation, it yeah. takes time to yield the desired results. Okay. So I am very happy Mutala accepted it today. So stop bashing us on the issue of the free senior high school. Because you know we will start ripping the benefits of that laudable, unprecedented policy. Right. Oh my God. You take time. I also know they are writing. I hope you are getting the argument. So, oh, my, oh my God, man. So they will get the benefit. And the uh, policy of one district, one factory, it will take us time, the benefits will start, will start coming. So it's an admission that sometimes they know, no, but okay. deliberately they just want to throw something out there. So you all know, Senna, if you want to farm today, yeah. you get the land, you get your tractor to go and plow the land. Before you go and then uh, uh, plant your seed, it takes time before you can harvest. That is how it is run. But right from the one when the policy is conceived, trying the implementation, the bastardization is coming. That is why Motala, sometimes we also ask. You also have the good, the, heart, uh, the, uh, the people of this country <coughs> at heart. And you have the opportunity to stir the affairs of this country more than any other political party in this country. What are some of the tangible interventions that has put in place that jet towards alleviating and rating the suffering of the Ghanaian people. Sometimes you force us to ask you people those questions. And I refer to health, national health insurance. When that policy, President Kufford then will talk, many people in the NDC said, no, it is not possible. <coughs> but I'm only, I'm very happy some of these things today, we are not talking about the implementation of them we are only talking about how to sustain them. So now, I think if we want to uh, go into details of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the mid-year budget review, I think we will have, but I just want to talk about the infrastructure development because it is also another area that we have been received. It was supposed to be the year of uh, bastardization. So, but yes, the minister talked about it. For instance, he talked of the Temamoto we ran about, a trade type interchange <coughs> which is completed and commissioned. The Pukwasi interchange is there, urban transport project. We have the Obichabilamte circle. We have the Tamil interchange project. We have the Kumasi road, the drainage extension, which costs government about... Mm, yeah, and, and a total amount of 6.4 billion has been so far spent in the road sector. And this means that uh, the other contractors that who were owed monies have been paid some have gone back to side. And with all this thing, but government is still spending money on the road sector. Today, for instance, if you go to uh, in terms of uh, educational infrastructures, I don't know whether this week, if you have read on the portal, you see the Get Fund Administrator, now warning contractors, anybody in 2019, six months, if you haven't gone to site, I think steps should be taken to terminate 
your project because all RSO uh, building contractors, especially those who are executing uh, educational infrastructures, has been paid up to 2019, as we are sitting now. And that statement is coming from the administration, and that is significant. And if we also look at it in terms of the where when we came in government in, 20, in 2017, there were uh, areas government had to be paid 11 point something billion Ghana city which the Minister of Finance commissioned the Auditor General to look into it. At the end of the day I think 5 point something billion was paid. The rest I think that was didn't follow or were just some imagination. So it is a way of saving revenue for the state and mobilizing and using the revenue for the development of Ghana. And exactly that. Now, so there are a lot of areas but critical among them with COVID you know, when the budget was pre presented, nobody anticipated that we will be hit by COVID. And now COVID has come, then a lot of things has to be re look at. So I was very impressed that businesses have been taken into consideration. A lot of interventions have been mentioned in the, in the review that government is going to roll out to cushion up businesses in this country and make sure the individual are not put in the uh, left to, 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 to suffer that much. Uh, the Obatampa program, that is 100 billion that mm. will be soon be commissioning. And, but why are you laughing, my brother? So yeah, all these things are areas brother. that... Brother, go, I go. not ask permission before I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so government to uh, establish 2 million guarantee facility to support all sectors of business and job creation. Establish unemployment insurance scheme. Create 100 uh, fund for labor and what a faith based organization increase their cap bus program, retain provisions of free water and extension, electricity. So, all these things are a uh, programs to roll out to a uh, cushion and ameliorate the suffering of the Ghanaian people as mm -hmm. a result of COVID. So, Sina, I by and large, in conclusion, I think that after listening to the finance minister on Thursday. Mm -hmm. I tell myself as every years, we are in the right direction and there's hope for this country. What we need to do is to uh, keep uh, supporting government and just uh, and keep the peace. So it is not surprising when you go around and you see people in the queue struggling. Some have been in the queue for hours to get registered. You can clearly understand that. It is because of some of these things to, no, to, to, to maintain government. to maintain the status quo, to maintain the ruling government for the good work that the government is doing. So I am not really surprised. As usually, it won't be long. So a few months away, four more to do more, like exactly what is contained in the media yeah. budget. Thank you. Of which my brother Mutala Thank admitted. you. Thank you, Muji. Thank you for We have even got Says, good morning. The, the media budget review by the finance minister is nothing else but a campaign budget review. But Ghanaians will not tolerate any useless propaganda from the MPP government. Uh, David Oforiaye says, it is interesting listening to Mujib in his reaction to Nanado being a dictator. His reason being that there cannot be dictatorship when there is parliament. The Dan Kwabusia tradition justified the 1966 coup on the basis that Nkrumah was a dictator. The question is, was there a parliament? Well, this one also addressing the same issue. Isa from what says to Mr. Mujib, I don't understand why you are defending the dictatorial nature of Akufuade and fighting Mr. Free Yankra. When no, you and your no, boss. No, I, I think, yeah, we'll in, it just the we context. Don't, don't just the context. Yeah, the fight doesn't okay. mean that you're three blues. Okay. Uh, when you and your boss, Mr. Kobna Ejepoin, Mr. Polafoko, former national chairman of the MPP, are victims of the violent and dictatorial nature of Akufuado, uh, he said, please stop this mischievous act of yours and admit to the truth. Akufuado is violent in a dictator, period. Is free anchor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that um, for me, um, the question we should be asking ourselves is that uh, in this review budget, can we trace the trajectory of all the other budgets and the promises that were made, whether year back to back they've been fulfilled? And if you do a proper content analysis, which will be done very soon, you realize that more often than not, they are just repetitions. In fact, there are particular paragraphs 
that are lifted even from NDC budget. Unfortunately, I don't have that analysis here. <laughs> exactly. You know. Mm -hmm. Are we bad for taking something that is good? That's the one. Is it bad? That's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm just saying he's letting him make his point. I, I don't have the I'm, luxury I'm, of time. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that you will see that a lot of times the minister comes and then he makes promises so is, yeah. and then he continues the following year. And I've also seen a lot of um, free, free, freebies. But I think what bothers me is the uh, inherent deception. For instance, this whole business about free electricity for for the vulnerable and the impression is created that though we are going to get the electricity for free you should ask yourself what is the percentage of people who belong to that so-called vulnerable group it's, it's municipal it's just a small percentage so at the end of the day it's actually nothing and you recall the previous times when they said we're going to have free electricity for three months and you know the difficulties people have had in actual fact when people go to pay their bills the bills, the, the, the amount, amount is more. And then they also put VATs on electricity. So did we go or did we come? In one bed, you say you're going to give us electricity for three months for free. And then three months down the line, you now come and increase VAT on everybody else, including those who are not captured in that threshold. So it's deceptive. Now, I also found interesting the amount of money uh, that they said they spent on cooked food. It, that for me is very, very worrying. Perhaps that could be the reason why they desperately want Mr. Domelevo out, because uh, Mr. Domelevo would definitely have audited. And indeed, we need a proper accounting of the huge amounts of money that they've taken. It, we are, they have to account for it. We just have four months for them to be kicked out of government, and they have to account for it properly. They took a lot of money, and the president took uh, um, his relative, the chief justice, albeit qualified, but he's still the relative, to sit on that fund, we need to know what was done, um, wh what is the status of that money. And so they spent huge amounts of money in preparing cooked food. That in itself was a wrong strategy. Because if you look at best practice globally, countries like um, Rwanda and other countries that have managed this situation well, you don't give cooked food one meal a day. You know, you see some miserable rice or some miserable fish head, and then you go and give it to a, a man with a family, a wife, children. So. What if they eat that meal? What 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 is going to happen subsequently? And that is why our flag bearer set an example by sending food packs, and that is the way to go. You do the food pack if it's rice with cooking oil with some tin meat, tin fish. Then the family can survive on it over time. We said that they didn't listen. For me, I was part of the private sector a fund that started uh, the distribution of the food to the vulnerable. But after a while, I realized that it was not sustainable, and they themselves they stopped it. And then they now invested their money into building um, a medical facility. And they've spent less money um, on, on building that facility than the amount of money. They actually sp have spent $31 billion to build the facility. And we say we've spent $54 million Ghana cities to um, give people food to eat. And again, it was politicized, unfortunately. Um, it became um, an, an MPP, school feeding women's, you know, opportunity for them to cook and distribute the food. Again, another area where I have questions and which Honorable Adongo has raised is the question of the deficits. Um, per the analysis that he did, um, um, the government is saying that the deficit is 11.8%. Uh, but if you look at the um, uh, loans that were taken, project loans of 4.9 billion, program loans of 8.2 billion, euro bond, that is $2 billion, uh, which is um, 11.6 billion. The total will be 24.7 billion CDs from external sources. And then if you add the domestic borrowing of 32 billion, if you add the domestic borrowing to the local, uh, the, the loans, 24.7 and 32 billion, you are looking at 56.7 billion. So the deficit should now be 15.6%. Okay? But they are claiming that the deficit is 11.8%. So what they have been doing is they've been doing creative accounting, where they hide some of the loans and some of the expenditures, and then they come and declare a lower expenditure. And when you do this, eventually it will affect you. To affect the value of the city, it will show. And you recall that some time ago, they did, they did the same thing. They gave different figures and reports to parliament 
and then they went to the IMF and also gave a different report. And I believe that we have um, the fiscal responsibility law, right? Yes. And I think it's time that we activate that so that the finance minister cannot just come and come and just uh, deceive us. Um, again, you look at the, in terms of the, the loan portfolio or the, our, our, our um, debt to GDP ratio, the quantum of loans that this government has taken is unprecedented in the history of this country. It's, it's frightening. I mean, and, you know, if, if, if um, that is how to run an economy, just come and take loans, bonds, loans, but everybody can run an economy. All you do is to, when you need money, go to the euro market and take loans at high interest rates. You bring it in. When it's finished, you go again. You go and take another one. That is exactly what is happening. So the NDC in our time, by the time we're leaving office, the debt profile was 120.3 billion. We have things to show for it in every sector. And it's since independence. So from independence to the time the NDC left office, the debt profile was 120.3 billion since independence. And we have things to show for it. When it comes to the educational sector, you can't even, we, we have a over 200 page document here. Shows different projects. And when we talk about projects, people only look at the, um, the school blocks. It's not that. Talk about educational administration blocks, you know, uh, vehicles that were distributed, equipment that were procured, training programs, massive investment. Tangible, you can see. Okay, what has the MPP done in this period? in terms of education, nothing. Even the buildings that we started, they've not completed. You come to the health sector. It's there for everybody to see. If it had not been for Don Mohammed's uh, UGMC by now, we would have had, unfortunately, many of our friends in the MPP dying. UGMC has become their salvation. And you know, sometimes nature and God has a way of teaching people lessons. Because so we didn't do anything. There's nothing. All those projects were, what, uh, what name were they using for it? They said we're what? Uh, Photoshopped. Photoshopped. Photoshop. Photoshop. Now you go and sleep in the Photoshop hospital. Ultra modern. Talk about the, the maritime hospital. Talk about Ridge Hospital. Talk about the district hospitals. All over the country. Talk about the hospital improvement project where over $250 million was spent in improving facilities, state of the art equipment in all these hospitals across the regions. It's there, tangible. It's there for everybody to see. Okay? Talk about the road sector, they are claiming credit for Tema um, motorway. Oh, we, we, we have it was President Mahama who commissioned that project before leaving office. So, how can they claim credit for it? On Ubecha Bilante, we started the process. So, the, it's there. Look at the circle interchange. We have tangible things to show. When they started the first year, first two years, third year, Anything you say, they say free SHS, free SHS. So in my mind, I thought that the free SHS was going to cost us so much, only for us to realize that it's only 3.2 billion. And under the MPP, from the time they took office till now, they have borrowed 135.4 billion. And so the debt uh, uh, situation is 255.7 billion. They have borrowed 135.4 billion within this less than four years. What have they to show for it? If you take away free SHS, which is their flagship pro project, assuming we even give them uh, um, five billion, it means one thirty billion. Uh, where is the money? Sikano, what have they done with the money? There is nothing to show. You know, that is why it's important that Ghanaians must rise up, go and register, and let's kick this government out because at this rate, the way things are going. Uh, disaster awaits us if we give them the opportunity to continue for a single day again. It's incredible, yeah. you know. So it is important that we realize that this government has failed. All the promises he's saying, what one district, one factory, where are the factories? The dams, we've shown evidence, tangible evidence. The dams are non existent, they are dugouts. I mean, nothing is working in this country. The banking sector that you came to meet. Even though there were challenges, you came. The banking sector needed just about two, three billion uh, uh, cities to, to, to recover. You came and you've spent four, five, six, seven, ten times that to bring them back, yet you haven't paid depositors. People have lost their jobs. People have died at, as a result of that. Now you say you're going to pay them 50% of their deposits in five years. What kind of government is this? Please. Okay. Let's Thank keep you. this government out so that we can have some peace. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, would you uh, please? Uh, have eight minutes. I beg you, just five, example. Uh, oh, so, <laughs> so that's one five. minute. Yes. No, but it is true. I want to acknowledge what my brother said. It is not only infrastructure that when you look, then you can credit government for performing so well. But it is also true, we have to remind them that it is true a lot of projects were awarded, but when they were exited, they could not pay for those projects, so the arrears yeah, pile up. I am coming. Mm. Mm. You allow me. The loans they took, <coughs> servicing of the loans. Mm -hmm. So if we're not servicing the loans, ah. and we had to restructure some of them. No, but I'm only trying Every to do government service loans. No, but that is Every what I'm saying, Mutala. But the point is, is you, don't only have, you don't only have to take government, because government borrowed, but what are the infrastructure to sue? Okay. When you said, that is the point. When so you we, said we, our we, infrastructure we, were not existing, when you said they were not existing. But you are what? Project for that. We don't even know where you go. We you took those projects. That was what happened. But for the first time when we came, we need to pay for those projects and sanitize them. We need to pay for those projects. That is why today the point is made. The contractor and Kumasi described the president as a rascal because they have not been paid. Oh, it's not. Okay, my brother. The budget, yeah, I agree. that my only interest in the budget has been the social interventions. And that is only because the social interventions, I believe, particularly now, considering COVID-19, are what the average Ghanaian would be interested in. Right now, infrastructure literally means nothing to us. We are faced with a situation where we are thinking about our lives. And parents are faced with kids being at home and even having to pay school fees as the kids are home. People's jobs are gone. People do not have jobs presently. And so for me, all the other, from here to here, I didn't even pay attention. I just went straight to COVID-19 and social interventions, because that, that, that's what I truly care about. So let me go straight to um, this issue of health. And here, I would agree with Mr. Elvis Free Yankra and say that as a Ghanaian, perhaps today more than ever, I appreciate all the hospitals that were built and all the infrastructure that the NDC, you know, um, identifiably, like these are things we can touch, tangibles, you know. And the fact that today in COVID-19, these are the things that have come to literally help us and, 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 and rescue us in, in our time of um, distress. Mm. And so here immediately, I would give credits where credit is due and say that kudos, you know, um, for those things, the, infra the infrastructure health-wise. Also infrastructure in terms of the, the, the schools, but that's something I'll come to. Now, let me come to things like, and here I want to address specific policies because they come up again in the budget, this um, issue of supplying face masks and things like that and say that as somebody who spoke to a lot of people during this COVID-19 because this is when we really went out there and spoke to people and wanted to find out you know how we are dealing with the situation I'll be the first to admit that I don't remember speaking to anybody who said they got face marks from government it was mainly the churches mm. <coughs> and individual philanthropic um, endeavors mm. for want of a better expression that was out there meeting that need of face masks. Okay. And for a lot of people, 
Four cities, five cities is a lot of money. When you are faced with making a choice between buying bread for your child and buying face masks, for some people, that's a real choice and a real difficulty to make. So here, let's not take it for granted. And here, I wish government had done better. And I'll take it a notch higher and say that. To now take it a step further and say that the wearing of face masks is compulsory. I wonder how you're going to enforce that. If I can't afford it, are you going to arrest me and prosecute me because I cannot afford something that, mind you, I need for my health? So let's watch it there. Here, I will question the policies and I will question the implementation of those policies in this COVID-19 era. Be because what are you doing? Let me leave it there. Let me talk about these three T's that became very topical and again, finds itself again in our budget, testing, tracing, treatment, and say that I don't think that we have tested enough. I don't think that we tested enough. I insist. And I reference my own visit to the home market where I was privileged on that visit to sit with the minister, the, the regional minister himself. I had opportunity to sit with the regional health director, I think the deputy regional health director, his name escapes me. And I also had opportunity to walk into the markets and the police stations with the MCE himself. And at every point I kept asking the question, are we testing enough? Because this was the point at which Ho was, you know, um, one of those areas that had less recorded cases. Mm. And I said, we have less recorded cases, that's great. But how, how, how are we having less recorded cases when we haven't tested? Because we are not testing, and we are proclaiming that we have less numbers. <coughs> if you don't know, you don't know. It's not because you have less numbers. It's just that you do not know. So here again, I will speak about this issue of testing. Now let's talk tracing. And for tracing, I will come to Accra and talk about my encounter mm -hmm. with the Baba. Mm -hmm. If you go to Accra mm -hmm. Girls Secondary no, School. No, no, please. Let, let him. Let her, let her. Please, mm -hmm. please. Time, time please. Uh, no, no, don't worry. <laughs> it's please. Just address me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, 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 please, please. But, but, but those are the facts. Okay. Those no. are the facts. We are testing and getting the numbers. And now you are test. telling us that oh, we are not being edited. Please go ahead. So now when we go here, you take us there. We go here, you take us there. So Do you the right thing. The numbers we are getting. Oh, right. 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 let, 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 let me talk mm. about this issue mm. about trees. And here I'm going, I said, like I said, I'm going straight mm. to Accra Girls mm. Senior. Mm. You know, so, and when I went there again with my team, we went to the Accra Girls. Of course, we we're not allowed oh, in because of all that's happening at the Accra Girls. But we walked around a bit and we, 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 we went to this barbering saloon just by the school. And we're privileged to speak to the Baba there and he said that he's the the baba that goes to the cry girls school to cut the hair of the girls and that in fact for this this now from the when we reopened schools he had been there to cut their hair this man in terms of tracing so today has not been tested so if we are talking tracing what kind of tracing are we doing such that the man who went with scissors to Accra girls, to Baba the girls, to cut their hair. Nobody has thought to think of this person in this, in this issue of tracing. When, as of that day, when I went and I spoke to him, 55 was the number from Accra girls alone. 55. Had tested positive. As of that day, when I was speaking to that man. And yet we sit here and we speak of tracing, that we are doing well testing, tracing, treatments. So now, do you understand the gravity of the situation that we are dealing with? And I said to him, you need to get tested. He said, of course I would love to get tested. But where should I go? I've been to the hospital. And I've been told that it needs to be contact tracing. So there are people who willingly themselves would actually want to be tested. I do not know where to go how, and, and what to say. Let's talk about treatment. And here, of course, I'll come back to recommending the NDC for all the health structures that we have because, you know, these are the facilities that today are holding our hands. Would you, Would you stop surprise. laughing? Let, let, let's, let's come straight to social interventions. Let's talk water, electricity. Here, I reference when I went to Medina Market. I, you see, I think it's one thing when we sit down and we draft these policies and we put figures and numbers. Let's, let's go on the ground and speak to the people. In Medina Market, the market women said to me that, Till today, well, sorry, till that day, and this is on tape, they were still paying for water. It was not free. 
So the president would announce that water for the next three months is free. The president in his budget will come and you know, declare that for the next three months, water is free, electricity is free. Now go and speak to the people on the ground and they'll tell you that we are still paying for water. So what are we doing? I'm the first to appreciate social interventions and say that they are great. I will be the first to say that at a time like this, even if it's expensive for us as a people, it is necessary to mitigate the sufferings of our people. The social interventions are very important, very necessary. And I'll be the first to applaud. And that's why when I picked the budget, that's the first slot that I went to. That's what I want to see, that we are taking care of the vulnerable and we are taking care of our people. However, when it, it seems as though all of it is lip service and politics as usual, then I have a big issue. Okay. Then I have a big issue. Okay. Now, let's talk about this issue about food. And I hope that will be your last one. Oh, yes, that will be my last. I'm way past my time. Sorry. Like, like, food. Let, let me just speak about food and say that 5.3 million for food. And again, let me reference no, now in the Medina market. 54.3 million. million. Let's not forget the point three. <laughs> <laughs> And, and speak about when I was in circle also, I said that the people insisted that they had not received it. Those who said they had said it, the woman said, I, I went for it. Kinky and fish in a pack. I have four children with my husband. What are we going to do? That's one. Now let's talk about accountability. How are we going to audit this 4.3, 4, 54.3 million, forgive me. How are we going to audit this? What documents are you going to use to, 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 to explain away this figure? And how are you going to verify distribution? Hmm. Oh, I distributed 50 packs at Accra Mall. How are you going to prove that you distributed 50 packs at Accra Mall? So for me, policies are important. But the most important thing is implementation. And as we establish these policies, let's always have accountability as part of the policies. Because now we are faced with 5.4 million that we can never explain. I don't see how anybody is going to audit this and do a proper auditing of this exercise. How are you going to do it? Absolutely impossible. Now, I'll speak about sustainable employment and say that today people have lost their jobs. My, 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 one of my friends said she had four uh, domestic staff and she's asked all of them to go. First of all, you are, you are afraid of contracting the, the virus because of people coming to your house. The reality is that I want my government to take care of me in a time of need. This is why I need government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Chum, could you say, Senator, ask Mujib how the NDC could have been against National Health Insurance Scheme when it was already in place before the MPP took office in 2000? If you wish to know, the NHRS was already in place. Their headquarters was in SNEET building. It was under SNEET, and some of their employees included the current judicial secretary. If you don't know, Google, please. Also, Ghanaians should know that the proposed unemployment insurance scheme is another tax that will soon be imposed on workers. As if the Ghanaian worker is not already an overtax species. Of course, the whole idea is to set up yet a new bureaucracy to accommodate the rest of the friends and family who have not been accommodated under the cryptocracy that as it stands. Lastly, Ghanaians should ask themselves how almost $10 million was spent on rice and stew without meat. When one of their ministers was quarried, they said they, they used fish powder to make the stew. So the food wasn't protein deficient. <laughs> How pathetic. <laughs> Could you answer this one? It's not true. <laughs> Sam Fiale has also, Ambassador has sent me a message. It says, kindly ask Mujib, which consultant designed the Pokwasi, Obechebi, and Tamaita changes? Which countries finance the projects? And which member of your government signed for your government? Mujib, the fund which is going to be established. Has your government sent any bill to parliament to establish the bill yet? If not, when are you going to send the bill before December 2020? Mujib, the fund for the on COVID issue. Mujib, is the 100 billion Ghana going to be taken from the IMF or finance from GOG? Your government said they were going to give us free electricity. Have you heard that the independent power producers have threatened to shut down if they are not paid a uh, government debt of 1.5 billion US dollars? Again, are these promises as usual? And you said you collapsed financial institutions and killed 400,000 jobs. Is that comparable to 100,000 NAPCO jobs? And he ends with uh, the compliment for AMA. Because AMA, yeah, revelation to the program. And uh, that's not the only one. This one is also from Angelo Kojofiak, who says, Mr. Pratt might be 
the happiest father on earth today, seeing the daughter stepping on into his footsteps. Said, I let the NDC know shouting on rooftops or going to the law court will not yield anything fruitful for them. The game is now for men. Let them call on the strong men with muscles in the party so we can start seeing results. Akufo Ado doesn't understand peace. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for those messages. There's a lot more that people are accusing me of not reading. But unfortunately, I have to end it here. Uh, uh, yeah, joining... Okay. Victim of the oh, but let's, 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 let's move on. Let's move on. NDC oh, what, what what candidate for Tamale Central. <laughs> Mujib Rahman ah, is a member of the do? MPP's communication team. <laughs> we had the privilege of Mr. Visa Friyanka, who is the director of elections of the National Democratic Congress today. We hope to have you on the program some other time again. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and then we had the wonderful she opinion. Was and in fact, she was really sitting yes. <laughs> Very, very, very good representative. So, I have a question because I'm a friend. Friend. He's he's the host oh, of the oh, 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 on this network. Uh, she, 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 she should be a regular. 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 Yes. I don't think she should give us a break now. A consultant. Good afternoon to Mr. Kwesi Prajinia, who is unavailable today. And thank you very much for making time to join us. A big thank you to Ahunta 92.3 FM. A big thank you to the several affiliate radio stations across the country. Uh, I understand one of those affiliate radio stations celebrated four years uh, this week. Uh, that is Global 105.1. Uh, they celebrated four years on the 23rd of July. And it was also the birthday. Okay, so a happy belated birthday to Egypt, Kudo, Toto. And, uh, and of course, we marked the passing of Professor John Evans at Tamils. Very importantly, like Kama said. Those of us who are jumping around, saying we believe in Mills, should ask ourselves the question, do we believe in what he stood for? Peace, unity, and progress of this country. My name is Senna Nombo. We are back same time next week. A big thank you to Tijani and the crew. Take care of yourself. We'll see you next week. <laughs>